Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another edition of the TetraCast. This is RPG Sites' weekly podcast where we get the site staff together to talk about our favorite genre of video games. I'm your host. My name is Brian Vitali. Joining me, I have most of the crew here. We have Josh Torres. Do you think I'll die if I eat a Kentucky fried chicken double down? I don't know. Based no. on Cullen's impressions, it seems like it's about, you know, 50-50. No, I ate worse. Okay. I haven't heard from him, so we'll have to check in after this. Uh, you heard the voices <laughs> of, of Chow Min Wu and Adam oh, Vitale. Hi. Yeah, so uh, we have the four of us this week. James is taking the week off. It is middle of March. We're recording this on, I believe it's the 11th. And it's been an interesting week of news. There's been quite a big headline coming out of Square Enix's financial reports in the last couple of days. A few smaller releases. I know there's one game that Josh Bolt does and doesn't want to talk about that came up on that went up on the site as an official review in the last couple of days. And then we had a few other things that James put up that we'll make sure to call out for him while he's not present to speak to them on the podcast and then go through uh, some usual release dates as we uh, do every week on the podcast. So yeah, to- I, I actually, actually just found out like, yeah, J- James is at Arc World Tour right now, which is the fighting game tournament of the Arc System Works games so that that's how he's there in person right now oh. very exciting he could have just yeah. said that he just he just said i won't be here i, I don't yeah. know I, I just saw the story. I was like oh he's at arc world tour that's right i forgot that he's going to arc world tour and like oh right that's that's cool oh, i man, hope man. he comes back with blaze blue news <laughs> <laughs> good luck i do want to watch that later today too but that's he really is, fun so he's, he's just attending it as a spectator yeah as a fan so obviously it's middle of March, and we've as we've been kind of talking throughout the first chunk of this year so far, it has been pretty busy and tons of releases every week as we've been going through January, February, more, February, and March. This week is the first week where it first finally starts to slow down a bit, and lots of us are still playing through Octopath. I know I haven't yet made time for well long. Trails to Azure, the official Western localization, is coming out in just a couple of days. The re- review embargo just released within the last week. And then we're going to go into April and May, where a lot of that release landscape is still kind of forming into place. So we're kind of got the first, you know, the first chapter of the year is closing up and we're going into a little bit more of the of the wild unknown as we go as we get out of the quarter one deluge that every year seems to have. Um, the one game that I have earmarked here to talk about, I would say at length, but I don't know if how, how possible that is, is a game mm-hmm. that I know that Josh has been playing in the background and been pretty darn excited about, and I know a few others, Colin included, have also been putting some time into this, and that is a Square Enix published game called Paranorma Site, The Seven Mysteries of Hanjo. Now, I'm going to hand this off over to Josh quickly here because I want to make sure that he can speak to it correctly because I don't know much about this other than, in general, the word of mouth that this game has been receiving over the last couple of days has been quite, quite stellar. Yeah, surprisingly critically acclaimed. I thought I was like going to be like alone, or maybe might be like the, the lone exception of like maybe I'm just like maybe I'm, I feel like I'm the only one who feels really highly about it. But then when the review embargo lifted earlier this week, like a lot of outlets almost like gave it a perfect score. Like even on our side, I gave it a nine out of ten. I felt really strongly about it. And like I saw many other outlets gave it like around that ballpark. And it's like holy shit, you know. And then like just the word of mouth of this game as people have like played it uh, has been really been pretty good. And the, the, the really nice thing about this game, the really kind of weirdly refreshing thing about this game that like you see from people about this game is one this is not a full price release like it it retails for twenty dollars usd but it's a discount at many many places like down to like 13 to 16 dollars you know depending on which um retail digital retail store you get it from and it's like it's 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 not that long of a game it's like maybe 10 to 12 hours long which is you know pretty nice like you don't you don't have to super invested in it you know it won't take about like a good chunk of hours like it's just like a you sit down you experience something really nice and something really engaging and you know and you're like wow that was really awesome and then you know you can go on with like your day and like this took me like a weekend to finish like from start to finish and like that was it was it was unforgettable i'd say like you know it was this this game will stick in my mind with like how it's not nicely paced because it's like it's very dense Nothing really drags on for too long. You're not really, it doesn't really like, you know, stay in one spot for too long. So I guess the. Hon- honestly, give me more shorter quality games that yeah. don't just go on and on and on. Yeah, but TS up here a little bit. Like, what is Paranormal Site? Uh, yeah. Like, can you compare it to anything else? I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's actually possible, but just try to, just try to see us up. Yeah. Okay. So th- this was first like unveiled, like at the, the Japanese version of the last Nintendo Direct live stream. Like, if you, 
few weeks back like it was like it, but you know after that that nintendo direct you know square enix went and said yeah this will be a worldwide release it's like okay cool because you know uh it was brought to like you know our attention like oh they showed like this new square enix game like at the japanese uh the nintendo direct it was like an adventure game it was like horror it was like what the fuck but in terms of like broadly what people can expect like if like you know if they're going to it like what what is the gameplay of this game like i'd say like in the spectrum of like adventure games if you're like if you have like background in between like whether it's like more like zero escape or ai the somnium files like hud wise and how you engage with characters it's more like ai the somnium files except like your field of view is 300 usually 360 degrees so like when you're, when you're this takes place like in a suburb in japan um and like you can usually swing your camera around like your character a full 360 degrees and they're like the really cool thing about this is like uh, like the, all the backgrounds in this game is like it's like kind of like set like set over like real screenshot photography of like japanese places but it's like it's like given like like a, a painted sort of a step so like uh, so it's kind of like it's not like fully de- a fully detailed ph- photography shot it's like more stylized like you'll see there's like some they pop out like the the edges of the photograph but then kind of like mesh it a little it's like some filters so it like is more elegantly used as a background because you know you'll be interacting with characters so like you don't want the background to be too detailed where like it'll obscure characters or like or environmental objects that you may need to like um you know observe and like examine and interact with uh, to proceed and like and to contrast this background style like the the characters are designed by Gen, Gen Kobayashi, which people may know uh, was one of the character designers who worked on Neo: The World Ends with You, and like it, this style like really really pops out in this game. With like it's kind of like a kind of like a more uh, watercolor painting esque sort of like style over the characters with like bold edges. Like any screenshot of this game, like you'll under, you'll understand almost immediately. Like it's like oh wow, that's a really distinct uh, visual look that goes over like like. The, the photography background so it's, it's, a, it's a really really cool like when you see this game it's like it owns this style like now like mo- moving forward when you see like something that's sort of, sort of like this it's like oh that reminds me of paranormal thing because this game just like just kind of just does something different differently like with, with its visuals and how it looks and it's like it's really really cool and, like the way that like these character portraits and illustrations animate like they they also like kind of like move and like when they're talking to you and when they gesture it's it's really it's really nice and refreshing. Yeah, as you're talking, I'm a, I have a Steam page pulled up, and I kind of see what you mean about how the characters are kind of framed out. They're not just overlaid on top of the photograph; they're they're like framed out from it. And it's hard to describe. I'm not exactly sure of the actual artistic technique there, but it is something where I, if I've seen images of the Kochi games and like Digimon Survive and things like that, that it does have a, an art style that's quite different from any of those other ones. Yeah. In terms of like talking about the game, like I guess we'll we'll just timestamp obviously this this part. Like I recommend people if they want if they're interested in it at all, like go in knowing as little as possible. That's what I did. That's what many other people are doing, and like they're coming out very pleasantly surprised, like I did. Um, it's just like that. But like starting to talk about this game and like what actually like is the premise of this game is sort of difficult. If like if you want to at least talk about like the first hour of the game and what happens there, so like. You know, talking about this game briefly, I will talk about what happens at the first hour. But like I mentioned in the review, and I'll mention here, it's like, if you don't want to know that, then like, you know, go skip on to whatever the next section is. I think we'll just be going like to article shoutouts and use right after. But yeah, just got know that going in. Uh, but like I said, like, this is way cheaper than most new games these days. And it's, it's very consumable. It won't take up much of your time. And it's worth it, you know? I think it's really worth it, and I'm really, really glad that, like, both people who are reviewing it and people who are playing it are, like, pretty much, like, in similar camps of, like, they've had positive experiences with it. Like, I don't think I've really heard anyone, like, come away with it, like, having like, a negative experience. If anything, like, like the, the thing that I'll say is, like, don't be too, like, uh, scared off by, like, oh, man, I'm not really good with horror. Like, I, I understand that, like, I'm not really, like, super great with horror games, too. Like, I can, like, play a little bit of them but I, i'm not really like always going to the next horror game and like going to like whatever's the scariest experience for me i i'd say there's like one of the more accessible horror adventure visual novels in the sense that like there are a, like you know very few jump scares here and there it does happen it only happens for a split second it doesn't it doesn't like keep you in that panic state when like when a jump scare happens it only happens for like that split second uh but 
more uh, the, the scarier uh, vibes come from like the eerie atmosphere. The more like just kind of setting you in that mood through the like, the visuals, the audio, the pro- like what's happening in the moment. It's like it's more meant to like give you like a, a sort of like a scary mood rather than like keeping you in that tense situation on whether you're gonna like find a jump scare or not. It's it's le- it's very much not about that. and more like just give like, like you know setting a tone and. The nice thing about this game is like it doesn't keep you in that in that mood for too long. Like it'll maybe keep you in that like a little bit like afraid in that like atmosphere for like maybe ten to fifteen minutes, but then it'll switch things up and be a way more lighthearted. Like uh, you know, during some sections when like you're doing like more like investigations during like you know daylight. You know, and it's like it's not, okay, so it's not like okay, I, you're not going to be always scared for that th- throughout those ten hours. You're always going to be you're constantly going to be switched up between like. Maybe some funny moments, some lighthearted moments, some disturbing moments, some maybe tense situations, but you're not going to be always scared. And that, that's that's the really key thing about this game is that it's really good at pacing itself and making sure that players are never like left behind what it's trying to do, which is the nice thing I liked about it as well. It's not like, oh, that's, it's not like, say, like the Dead Space remake, for example. It's not like always going to be scary every time you walk into a new section, like, oh, fuck. You know? when, when I think of scary games, I like 10 years or so ago, back when the amnesia titles were like pretty uh-huh. vogue on Steam. Yeah, I honestly played one for like two hours and then I was just too chicken shit to go beyond that. I remember I think I went into the basement, got killed by like a pig demon thing. And I'm just like, nope. Not for yeah, me. yeah. So it's yeah. nice that it's nice that this game seems like it's using that sort of foreboding, tension, tense mood and setting rather than trying to actually scare the player. It's more yeah. uh, an era of mystery and an era of maybe, maybe dread. You didn't, you didn't use the word dread, but that's kind of the way you seem to describe it. Yeah, yeah like, like yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll like, you know, you will, you will get into those situations, but you're not in, the, in it for too long, say. So, like I said, like, if you don't want to know anything about this at all, and you're interested already, then skip ahead. I'm going to start talking about a little bit of, like, you know, the first hour of the game to, like, kind of, dis- like, broadly discuss, like, you know, my, my thoughts and overall impressions. So, Paranorma site uh, opens up in a very cheeky way. You don't even like go to like a main menu at the very start. You're in it right away. It like kind of gives this. I know, I know there's already setting a, a tone for us, you know, elderly people. But <laughs> it, it starts like in a colored television CRT, and you have this narrator called the storyteller. And it's like very you know introductory elements like uh, you know your name. You know, introduce you to the UI. You know, very like kind of like uh, the storyteller even emotes like here's the, here's the, like the the UI. You know, you can like see various options here. You can adjust settings here and whatnot. Uh, and and the, to to set the mood right away, I, I mentioned this in the review as well because it's something very key to like ha- have in the back of your mind as you're going through this game. Is he asks you a very you know general question. It's a, a question you know you you probably come across you know once or twice in your life, like you know where. Throughout when when you watch various media, uh, like it'll ask you, "Hey, if you had like the chance to resurrect someone, would you?" And then you know, there's the options of like, "Yeah, I'd, I'd even do it at the cost of my own life," or "I'd do it at the cost of someone else's you know life," or "I'd I'd do it if there's no cost attached," or "No, I'd pass on that. I you know that opportunity can go to someone else, not me." You know, so and you're just like, and then he's storyteller is just like, okay, I mean, like you know, there's no right answer to this question. Obviously, it's just like, just throughout the story, you're gonna meet various people that have you know different approaches to this question. They have answer. They all have different answers to this question. So just keep that in the just keep keep that in the back of your mind. So you wake up as this guy named Shogo. Sh- Shogo is at like at a local playground at this uh, suburban part of Japan. And with his uh, co-worker Yoko, oh, Yoko's a big occult f- fanatic, so she's out there exploring one of the, trying to find one of the seven mysteries of Hanjo, which is actually based on the like you know real life urban legends of like the seven wonders of Hanjo. This is all based in like you know real real occult like beliefs that uh, exist uh, today. Even very 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 popular like tales, uh, you know, uh, about that. So you know you get you're getting acquainted to like how the game works. You know how to interact with the characters, how to interact with your environment. You know you have like an option, like recall to like remember your first meeting with Yoko, uh, and so forth. And then just you know, as you're speaking with Yoko, you you, can, you find out there's this ritual called the Rite of Resurrection. And in this game, the, those seven mysteries of Hanjo 
are linked to this rite of resurrection, again, which is basically you know a, ri- a ritual to bring someone back. And for Yoko, she's like, you know, my dog died recently. You know, I've had for eight years. So she's still heartbroken about it. So she wants to, you know, see if there's any truth to this, like, kind of uh, supernatural stuff, you know, because she's a very big occult fanatic. So, you know, you're kind of speaking with her, and then all of a sudden, you know, something happens. Like, like the, 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 the screen, did, like, distorts and, uh, like, inverts its colors for, like, a split second. Something happens, feel the air um, change around you. You look back at Yoko. And she's like pointing to something behind you. She's like scared of something, something terrifying, like something's terrifying her. And you're like, oh, you're, that, that's weird. You look behind you, there's nothing there. What, what is she look, pointing at? And then you look back at her and she's dead. Like she kind of just dies, like slumped to the ground in front of you. You're like, what the fuck just happened? You know, and it's like, it's like, this is, it looks like she's like trying to like drown the live or something in front of you. It's like, what the fuck is going on? There's a nearby phone booth because you know there's the, there's a set in 80s Japan. There's no cell phones. Phone booth and big ass boxes, television boxes, square televisions. That's usually a thing with like a lot of anime or Japanese media that want to take advantage of the 80s setting because mm-hmm. they want to have an environment where people don't have cell phones. Yeah, and yeah, especially like you know, like well, part of the reason like you know, Yakuza Zero was very, very like popular for a lot of people is like it's setting as well it's like oh this is kind of like kind of novel to, to, to see you know when that came out back then it's like that that that's i like i like kind of like those guys that like kind of portray a time period like that like, yeah those were the days this is completely um, different mind space but i i think the same thing when i think of like the movie home alone oh, how, okay how, yeah. how that couldn't work this day or just be like <laughs> yeah next, meet me here okay or find find an uber driver <laughs> yeah so so you go to this phone booth you call the ambulance and then you know while you're waiting for the ambulance you're like okay i just i still have this unsettling feeling like something's still out there and like you notice a little trinket by yoko's corpse and like you go touch it and then this is kind of like kind of like the turning point of the game right i didn't i didn't know anything about this game going in but then once i like this happened i was like what the fuck is this game so this little trink is called a curse stone, and it's it's one of the like it's one of the seven mysteries of Honjo's curse stones. Like this little trinket basically is the curse stone for the Whispering Canal, which is one of the seven mysteries. And these little trinkets basically give you supernatural powers, given you meet their conditions. So essentially, they have a they have the the power to like kill someone if you meet their condition. And like as soon as Shogo touches it, like like he kind of understands everything that happens. He he becomes he becomes what they call a curse bearer, like a person who has one of these curse stones. And like the Whispering Canal curse stone that he gets, the activation for that is like if someone turns their back on Shogo with the intent to leave them, he can. That's the that's the prerequisite to activate this curse stone to kill someone immediately if they do that. And as you can tell. Uh, and if that sounds crazy to you, that yes, <laughs> it is as crazy as it as it sounds. It's like wow, that seems really easy to do. So, you uh, the thing about these curse stones is every time you end someone's life with a curse stone, the life energy of the person that you take is like turned into something called soul dregs. And uh, if you, if you fill up this curse stone enough with enough soul dregs. You can initiate the rite of resurrection. That's kind of the theory behind this. Like you know, and Shogo touches this, kind of like learns that immediately uh, throughout this. So the the very like the prologue of this game essentially is Sh- Shogo goes around this suburban part of Japan just looking for curse bearers in order to basically kill them to resurrect Yoko. So and, basically, and, is the idea that. Shoujo is cursed and then ended up taking Yoko's soul dregs on accident? Uh, who knows? You, 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 may, you may or may not learn about more, more things that happen in this uh, introductory section as you uh, play through the game, but I will say that if you have any questions now, it'll, the game will answer them. <laughs> I won't answer them for you, but uh, it is good to be curious in this game. Uh, so the, this whole section, uh, prologue section, is like teaching you game mechanics while you're going, traveling around town, and meeting like 
some of the significant characters in the game and you know so, some some will some will go badly for for them like i guess i will talk about like once again a pretty minor spoiler in the in the grand scheme of things but a really really clever thing that like was the thing in this game that like maybe go oh man this game might be really fucking cool was um, when you meet like a curse bearer in this game it's very reminiscent of like something out of like jojo's adventure bizarre adventure it because Shogo will like monologue to himself like, is this person a curse bearer? Like what what are what's the what's the act of like I better be careful. Like I don't want to like activate like, you know, what their curse stone or like meet the conditions of their curse stone essentially and like gotta have to outsmart them or outwit them. Uh, one of the curse bearers that you meet in this prologue very, very early on is a uh, is a, a guy with glasses named Namiyaki. His his role in the in the story at this point is like he's supposedly going around like you know trying to partner up curse berries so like you know they don't want to hey let's like work together to get through this i don't want to hurt you sort of deal uh, supposedly with this guy and he has the curse of the foot washing mansion you can kind of tell right away that he's not kind of someone you can trust so the 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 conversation with him, like no matter what, like kind of ends with him trying to at- attacking you with this curse stone, and the activation requirement for his curse stone is pretty crazy, because pretty much if you hear the voice of the foot washing mansion, you die pretty much. So like the first time like you meet this event, like Shogo dies, and you know like in in true like an adventure game you know logic you know like if your character dies you'll like you know you'll usually be able to like restart or redo something so like whenever like shogo dies in like this prologue you know you'll, you'll be able to redo it but always go back it always goes back to the, the storyteller it's like mm, we'll, we'll try that again but usually the storyteller will like give you a hint of like what went wrong so like in this one the storyteller is like you know you gotta you gotta find a way to you know uh make sure that doesn't happen so like if you're if you're not privy to like with that vague uh, like you know tip right away you go through it again you're like oh my god like Shogo keeps hearing like the voice of this foot washing mansion curse stone like what's going on what do I do and then like the story is like you know there there, there there's a, there's like there's a feature that you that you have for yourself you know like you know you can take advantage like you should take advantage of like your your options like features that you have at your disposal and you're like wait a minute like and then like you're you're already thinking about like something you already like feel like was like weird at the beginning of the game like there's like in the options menu there's like in the volume options like ba- background audio sound audio and then there's like option for like voice volume but there's no voice acting in this game and people speak to you and you're like and people will notice that right away like like why is there like a voice volume option if there's no one speaking and the story time at the very beginning of the game tells you like he tells you like he just something that doesn't click in your mind it's like it's like it's like the story title teller will tell you at the beginning of the game it's like if there's a voice you don't want to hear just turn down your voice uh, the, the voice volume and it's like yeah. it's like it's like something you don't think about it. it's like why why the fuck did he that's weird and then of course like you know as i'm already alluding to right you know you've been talking about it, it's like if you turn down this voice volume option to zero you can no longer hear that curse stone so you essentially Namigaki can no longer activate the requirement for his curse stone because yeah, your voice volume to zero, you can't hear it, and that's that's, that's really that's clever. Yeah. So and that that was like the turning point. That it's like okay, this game, this game's <laughs> this game's fucking clever. That's that's really that's really funny and a really really small like you know a small part of it. That's like wow, that's that's really that's really cool. So you know essentially like you know this whole prologue section. We'll come to an eventual end. If like to anyone who might have thought, "Hey, this whole game might center around Shogo's adventure or, or journey to resurrect Yoko," it's like, no, it's definitely not that. Just like this brief prologue that does come to an end. I won't say how it how it ends, but you're eventually all the things that you learn throughout this prologue path and how it ends. You're eventually transported back to the flashpoint of where yoko was terrified about something behind shogo and now all of everything that you've learned about curse stones curse bearers and this prologue this very very narrative premise core structure stuff it's like now you know don't face away from yoko try to get through to her 
and you do get through to her. It's like, okay, like, you know, Yoko lives, everything's peachy, you know, everything's good, right? So uh, the, the game will, like, ta- fast forward in time to, like, to the next morning. Um, Shogo already, like, got a cab for Yoko to get her out, like, you know, that night. And, and so forth. And then so fast forward to the morning, and then there's, like, a police report. And it's, like, there's a corpse that's been found at a, at a playground. And the camera pans down and sees, it sees Shogo dead. But, like, in the same way that Yoko originally died, where he looks like he, like, he like kind of, like, drowned alive. You know? And then that's when the title card of the game comes up. It's like, you know, this is, this is Paranormocyte, The Seven Mysteries of Hanjo. And then from there on, you know, you're trying to find the truth of, like, what's going on in this game? And then and, and just as a very core structure thing, the story time is like, here are the, the, the stories of three others. And, you know, you, it'll unlock, like, the story paths of, like, three other characters that you've met in that prologue path that, you know, may not have had a great encounter with Shogo. So all three of them, like, are, are familiar faces at this point. And then the, the common thread between them is, like, they're all curse bearers that they are that became curse bearers that night. And then, so it, you play through their stories, and like, you know, advent, like like an adventure game, you know, you'll eventually, like, get progress blocked as you're going down one of them, so you have to go hop on over to another character's story, um, and so forth and so forth. The game ha- does a lot of really cool things to, like, you know, switch up how you progress through them. Like, it, like there are some, like, tricky things. Like, for example, there will be, like, a story path with this character and, th- and they're they eventually get to a point where their progress is blocked but it's like it's very open-ended and like vague it's like they're like at some at some point this character's story is progress locked but they have the option to like go to like several locales in town and you're like that's weird like that they just give me the open option to like go to any of these locales like for for, for what purpose and then like it turns out like you want to like quote unquote park this character at a certain locale, like leave them there so when you go to another character's story and they visit that, that character is there and then you go interact with that character because you parked that character and that re- and their route, you know? So it does really a lot of like small cheeky things like that. I'm trying to I'm trying to make sure I, I follow. So you can you choose between these three characters at will or is it semi constrained? It it's at will, but but eventually you'll get progress blocked in like one of them. And you'll have to go down another character's path. It's not like totally linear where you can like finish a character story from beginning to end in one go. It's like no, you have to like bounce between them because the way they interact with each other's stories are like dependent on like in order to progress them. Eventually, you'll have to come to a point where you have to like progress another character's story. So like you're kind of at a certain point, you're like kind of going to like bouncing in between them because you need to like make progress on another person's path to like make more progress on that person's path so it's not so yes you can freely bounce between them but they're all dependent on each other to progress together uh it's kind of like a little bit like 4-2-H Shibuya Scramble yeah, and uh Chao will know that because he's played through that um and yeah but that that's all I kind of uh, really want to say to like uh, not, not uh, say much more that like as just like general premise setup it is it is a very cool game and just like it's the light to like kind of like play out of nowhere you know like honestly adam was like hey we got like you have an opportunity to cover the cover this year i was like i ah, might as well i have nothing on my plate and like i was very very surprised that you know i was actually gonna got. i was actually gonna ask like did this game have an author that you were familiar with like why did you decide to play it or did you just see like an advertisement and thought the art style was unique so the I mean, I'm kind of just a sucker for things that just like, kind of catch my eye. So when I saw like the trailer for this on the Nintendo Direct in Japan, like I was like, oh, that just caught my eye. But I, I, I was not, I didn't really know the staff listing of this game until after the fact, right? Like this is the from one of the ve- veterans in the Japanese adventure genre. His name is Takanari Ishiyama, and I did, I never heard of him until before this game. But he's apparently a very pretty famous like adventure game developer in Japan. You know, the, the only like link that like we might have to him over in the western part of the world is like he was a sound designer on Metal Gear Solid. Um, but you know, but he had uh, like this long list of adventure, this adventure series called the Detective Ryosuke Kibukawa series. I think there's like ten installments to that, and like they're they're like, they're, like kind of like about um, I, I think it's like a, about like a detective, detective and like as an assistant and like like investigating like the murder of a 
cult leader or something. There's like a really, really good thread. Um, a colleague of mine made on Twitter, his handle is Bull of Lentis, and he made a really, really great thread about like kind of like the, the key highlights of what Takanari Ishiyama has done over his career. Like I didn't really know about Ishiyama until this game and like after this game, like I'm a fan, you know, like the, I, he's very clever about what he did with this game. And also the the you know on top of like Ken Kobayashi as it, uh, we discussed earlier doing the character designs the Hidenori Iwasaki did the soundtrack for Ter- Paranormal Sight and they're known for you know t- they contributed to Final Fantasy 11 Front Mission 4 and 5 and also did a few tracks in Stranger of Paradise uh, as well and uh, like the soundtrack for this game is awesome it's it's very it's very varied and like it's it's like it's very it's very like you'll it stands out i'll just say this, it stands out obviously there's there's no voice acting in this game like uh, from characters like like it it the music background music is like very important more than ever to like kind of set the mood especially in a horror adventure game like it, you know the the soundtrack the game kind of lives and dies by its soundtrack in that sense and iwasaki did like a fantastic job with this game it gave me it reminded me a lot of uh, what you might hear in 428 uh, Shibuya scramble at some points, and like that's a, that's a that's good. That's very good, you know. Mm-hmm. Because fourteen is like an amazing game, and this game gets very close to that, I, you know. So yeah, uh, that's all I really have to say about Paranormal Sites. So if you you're interested at in what you've heard here, like you know, if you weren't sure if you'd like it, and you're interested, go pick it up. I I can't recommend it enough. You'll you'll have a blast. It's it's. That's all. I, that's all I can really say. I wanna. I wanna talk about it more, but I. I don't want to ruin it. And obviously, uh, I can't. Know. I can't speak to the game directly. But I just being a, being able to see some of the chatter between Josh and Cullen as they both played through it. it just there's just a lot of vicarious excitement about this game, and knowing yeah, that it's yeah. kind of this experimental thing that's not too long. That's something different, not an established IP. Sounds like it's kind of a. I don't know. I don't know if it's his debut, like creative director. Like I'm not sure exactly. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not exactly sure. Like if this like his debut on like a director on a directorial role. I didn't research that far into it, but you know. But hey, if it if it is, then what hell of a job. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But uh, but I'm not sure. Like if he he might have been a director on the the Kubukawa series. So I'm I'm not. But I'm not 100 mm. sure on that. Yeah, uh, it was it was funny because like the first night that Colin and I were talking about this game when we, like we first started it. Like I, I couldn't play like that long when I first like booted it up, but like I, I clearly recall that like I felt like like still being like a young kid and like I had to go to work that night, but I was like I was like super excited to get back to this game. It was like I felt like a kid, like you know, just waiting to like play a new game, brand new game. They're excited about like after school. Like I was like, oh man, like you know, I can't wait to get out of school to like play this new game. Like it gave me that feeling, just like. Just in its early hours, like it just felt so refreshing. I'm like, oh my god! Like that's it's been a really long time since like I really felt like really truly felt that way about a game because this game, like you said, like no established IP, you don't really have any expectations and you don't know what to expect from this game. And like I know there's we're gonna get to this later because of, uh, because there's been more news about like you know Square Square Enix financials and then we're definitely gonna talk about like you know is Square Enix like doing enough to market their games. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And like I know, there's been talk like you know the paranormal site has obviously become part of this conversation because you know obviously Square Enix hasn't really marketed this game. Like, is it this game isn't really visible in the West? You'll see like the occasional like tweet about it, but maybe like a small trailer that's not really like you know spreading around or, or you know. But it's kind of a weird thing for paranormal site in its unique case because like. You don't really want to show too much about it, like, I, like even even like the trailer that they showed. Now that I know, it's like it's like, oh man, they even though like people don't have any context at all, but what they're seeing, like for people who like play day, it's like, fuck, did they show too much? What the fuck? Why are they showing this? You know, it's like it's one of those tricky games that like you, I don't know how you market this game a lot to people and like keep it still fresh because like it feels like it's, it's kind of teetering on that edge of like if you show too much of it. You're kind of gonna, you're kind of gonna ruin it, yeah. So I kind of remain mixed on that front in that conversation, but we'll talk about that more later. But yeah, I mean, weirdly enough, there's kind of like the only new release that like we're talking about this week. But hey, I'm okay with it. I I really, really, really enjoyed this game. I'm glad that I had 
was able to experience it uh, without knowing anything and just going in totally, totally fresh. And what a blast. And it's been fun to like see friends, like, you know, just play it and like quickly finish it. Like, they're not like rushing through it, but it's just like a very, very easy game to just like play through briefly. And it's like, and it's like, wow, this is. I, everyone, everyone I've talked to has had a positive experience with it, and that's crazy. No, I haven't heard you talk so highly of a game since Ask Libra, so <laughs> I, I gotta try this out. It's like, is this our Ask Libra of this year? The I, 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 look, this, I don't know. This, this, is, this game is probably definitely going to be my top 10. We'll, we'll see about top 5. Very, very strong shot, but I like it a lot. <laughs> I like it a lot. No, it's always good to have an opportunity to talk about some of these under-the-radar releases and know that they actually hit, because I know sometimes I'll try to, you know, try an under-the-radar release, and then I end up just feeling kind of lukewarm about it, but it's nice to know that this one kind of both seemed intriguing and surprising, worth trying out, and then holding on to that reputation as you uh, as you played through it and kind of contributed to the positive word of mouth that it's had since its release earlier this month. Was it earlier this month, or was it like late February? This game, this game came out just, uh, just this week, this past gotcha. week. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah and like, uh, like Josh said, that's really the only game we have slated to talk about in our initial section of our podcast. I know some of us are still working through Octopath. We've kind of talked about that game a few weeks in a row uh, and we want to make sure that we have kind of more concluding remarks or don't want to just go piece by piece on that one. I know a few of us are working on some other late March releases. For instance, I will call out that Scott White was able to put up a review on the site for the Western localization of Trails to Azure. So obviously do give that a read if you're interested in playing that game as it comes out next week, I believe on the, is it on the 14th or on the 17th? Yeah, it's, the, you know, Trails Azure is still one hell of a game. And, you know, with all of the touches, the touch-ups that the Rate's company has made to it, obviously mm-hmm. the definitive version of the game up until this point, now obviously because it's officially localized as well. It's, you know, what can I say? I have very fond memories of that game. I do want to check out the, localized releases eventually as well but i guess that we should also slip into here that this past week also that this america also announced that they're just like how they did with uh with the yuta last year they're also going to be handling the pc version of kuro no kiseki mm-hmm. and they're going to release it like the, like like the yuta where they're gonna release the japanese version first and then eventually update it it with English, you know, eventually down the road. So they like, so this is kind of like your soft confirmation that yes. Yeah. Like, and uh, we, uh, we did we, talk about that a little bit last week, Josh. Okay. I mean, okay. I think I hear, hearing the, hearing it from your perspective, I think it's still valid, but it just, we were able to get James to talk about how this is okay. different from the clouded left. I forgot about the speaker last week, honestly. Yeah. I think, I think, I think it snuck in right before we recorded last week. But yeah, talk, talking about the nuances here. Something we forgot to mention, like the yeah. ultra widescreen support, 360. Yeah, the don't you see, yeah, the don't you see favorite frame stream stack is really funny, actually. Like, like who does that? The Rati is a fucking bad man. <laughs> like, who has a monitor that can, like, run this at 360 FPS? Well, well, Adam does. He has a 4090. This is top of the line, right? No, but I, you, you need a monitor to, like, display that. Like, enough, like, hertz on a monitor to display that. Usually, those, those like, frame rates above, like, 144... Typically, those are for like the Counter Strike guys who need like every possible. Yeah, like eight hundred frames per second. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I where it's I not a four K monitor or fourteen forty p. Maybe I, mean, I have a pretty now. high end monitor, and I think several of us do. But even that's just one twenty or one forty four. Those ones that go higher than that are pretty and you know, specialized. You know, just in case you need to do some competitive Kuro the Kiseki, you know, <laughs> the the, the Rante's got your back apparently. Uh, but yeah, that's. They showed a little bit of that. That's that's looking cool. Like hell yeah, no. But then yeah, just you know, just might as well mention it again. I guess soft confirmation, and that's we'll see. The, the stay tuned for what they have to. What else they have to say? Because uh, Reverie trails into, into Reverie is like July, and like even even though I guess we'll talk about it in the news also with the, what other things. In the news. Yeah, I I guess we can talk about it here. Just let's just because because the rest of this podcast is pretty much going to be news and a few feature shoutouts. So while we're on the Falcon talk, I don't think we have it here because in the last week or two, there was a new NIS America released the character trailer for Reverie. But yeah. the thing is, is that the longer into the, the deep, at least my opinion, is that the deeper into this uh, 
series you go, the less I'm interested in character trailers. Oh, I guess I say that, but with Kuro, <laughs> with Kuro, it would actually be useful. For Reverie, I'm like, I don't need a character trailer. I mean, <laughs> I the, who, the, I the first one, like, yeah, like uh, the Western audience is excited because it has like it has the English dub. Like the the Crossbell games don't have a dub because of, that's like, true. Their, Good point. Their, yeah, their legacy and like kind of their old games at this point, it'd be a tough sell to like kind of balance the cost of like having an English voiceover with them. But you know, with the character trailer, at least you know they they have a massive, massive, massive cast. So they have like a massive, massive roster of English voice actors <laughs> and actresses. Like you know, they handle it all. So it's it's nice to see because I just, like a lot of people preferred the English voice acting for the trail series over the Japanese voices. That, that depends yeah. on the character. Yeah, I, people have their favorites for sure. Like some people are some people are like, uh, you know, I prefer this character's English voice over their Japanese voice for sure. I think so, I'm in an opinion where all the guys sound better in the English version and most of the girls sound better in the Japanese version. Mm. Most of them. That's that's kind of like my opinion. Mm-hmm. Even uh, Johnny Young Bosch as uh, oh, I actually Joshua? Prefer the Japanese. I actually prefer the <laughs> Japanese one. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, Go for it, Chow. Uh, I was just going to say, the Japanese voice actress is... Uh, who is it? <laughs> it plays a character that you know in Gundam that everyone knows. Mm-hmm. Everyone knows. It's, it's in Gundam 00. I think that character has a stupid name. I'm trying to remember. It's one of the, oh, what was it? One of the innovators or whatever. Oh no! <laughs> when I when I when I when I think of stupid names in Double O, I just think of Hallelujah Haptism. Hell yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. There's a lot of stupid names in that show. Yeah, everyone loves calling people by their full names. Do people actually call people by their full names? That's what that's what makes Gundam Double O so charming. Okay, I think everyone always calls each other by their full name. It's like hello, <laughs> Adam. By tallies. That's an F say a lock on shadows. Chow Min Wu. <laughs> <laughs> Who calls me light a full name? It's so awkward every time I watch a show that way. I love it. Other uh, like, we'll get to the East stuff in like properly in the news, but the other like Nice America Falcom thing that they showed off this week was they got an introduction trailer for Legend of the Utah out and they did confirm that it's coming out this fall. Which kind of surprised me because I thought I thought the Utah was coming out before Reverie for whatever reason when they first unveiled it, but no, that they, they gave it an official release window of fall, and that's you know I'm excited. You know, I haven't I haven't touched the Utah since its PSP release. So, yeah, Adam, so Adam was talking to me about this. I was asking him about this before we started recording. Like, didn't they already announce this? Like, well, they announced the localization. There was the introductory trailer with that, which just said 2023, and this news just specifies. No, you got it wrong. Oh, I got it wrong again. They, ah. they had an announcement trailer, and now they have an introduction trailer. Oh, I see. I get it. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. I don't. I, I do not fault myself for not keeping those two things straight. So, but yeah, so now we have the whatever the one that came out second. We have another trailer coming out in fall. Still no. So we we went from 2023 to just fall. So now we know, like Josh said, that's coming out after Reverie. Yeah, uh, and, and, for, and once again, I always have to mention this for people. It's like. You do need you do not need to have played any of the trails or the Kiseki games to like enjoy the Yuta you did. This is totally separate and standalone for all those other games. There's not a turn based RPG, there's an action game. It's it's sort of more like old East games in a sense. The thing and is yeah. though, is when you say things like that, I think I feel like there's some inclination to be like, well, if it's not connected, then why should I play it in the first place? Because it's a good fucking game. Why no. don't you just like play a game that's good? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> no, no, I, I, I have that baggage. I know I completely agree with you, but I could see some people like with that opinion. With, yeah, like, with, yeah, with the way that like anime OVAs or some or movies are sometimes treated and things like that. And yeah, people are just fucking MCU brain. It's like, why should I watch this totally standalone superhero movie? It's not going to MCU. Yeah, you know, God. <laughs> I hate the, how the, the term filler has been bastardized uh, over the years. Uh, but uh, yeah, so yeah, that's uh, that's exciting to see. And once again, I've uh, we got to keep a close eye on how they're going to release this on Steam because this game is technically out on Steam already, but they're going to update that with the English localization. So th- this game will kind of be a test case of how Kuro's going to go. So like, will this game come back to the Steam front page? when it gets updated in English, because we don't, there's not really any precedent for that, I don't think, <laughs> Steam. <laughs> with this yeah, I don't know. Method. So whatever, whatever this, this, how this game is handled is going to be, is going to inform how Kuro is going to go, <laughs> I guess. I have a question. Do these games ever go on 
sale. Like, if they go on sale, wouldn't that like botch it? Like you get early discount because you bought the game early when they decided to add English localization. I, I imagine they go on light discounts for like the Japanese audience. And of course, of course, those discounts are probably I don't know if they're worldwide, but I feel like I've seen this game on discount last holiday, maybe. So I mean, uh, ultimately, you're not you're not really you're not taking money away from this America from like getting this on discount, right? Like in the end, if you purchase this on Steam right now without the English localization, like. That money is still coming back to Nice America and Falcom. Like, you know, whether this patches it or not, you're still getting the same game executable from Steam. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know? So I don't think I'd feel too guilty of like, oh no, I'm totally fucking scamming them. It's like, no, your, your, your money's still going to the same place you would have. Before we go into some of the other news announcements of the week, a couple other features that are up on the site, in addition to the Paranormal site review and the Trails to Azure review. These are both features from James, since he's not here to speak to them, we'll at least give him a shout out. If you listened to last week's episode of the podcast, you heard James's verbal thoughts on Destiny 2 as he's returned to it in order to play the Lightfall expansion. But for those that are interested in the topic or were not here to listen to that, to that dialogue last week, James did write up his thoughts in a feature up on the site. Returning to Destiny 2, it's hard to come to grips with being left behind. Basically about wanting to enjoy the game, thinking that mechanically it is significantly better than when he last left it in 2019. But of course, the usual hurdles with the content vault and the things like that. So he has that feature up on the site. He also updated one of his features about how the Steam Deck is, in James's opinion, the best place to play RPGs. I think that's a little bit absolute, but I will just say personal experience i've loved having the steam deck for games just like octopath traveler 2 being able to play it in bed and then back on my computer and then downstairs on my tv so uh, if you have feelings about the steam deck you can read up those thoughts from james on the site as well i i i feel bad i haven't touched my steam deck in months but it really helped me out when i was moving but i didn't have like a console to hook up i really I enjoyed it I really enjoyed it during that time. I actually didn't boot up the Steam Deck until Octopath 2 came out, so I, I wasn't using it. It was too, I don't know, it, it's very comfortable of its size, how it's weight equally distributed. But James, I mean, James makes a really good point about the Steam Deck, though, in terms of, in terms of like, this, like, that is the, one of like the best systems to like, play all of the pre-FF16 Final Fantasies. Like, that is the system that you can play FF1 through FF15, and you never have to like move away from that, from that system. So you can just get like play all the FFs before sixteen handheld, and you can even play like the Crisis Core remaster and all the other stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? Not not their servers though, unfortunately, and not tactics yet either. <laughs> well, yeah. maybe you could probably you could probably. Oh yeah, you can set up an Yes, I mean then you, you technically you can technically play anything then. Yeah. Well, stuff at sixteen. Con- so. con- yeah, conversation becomes kind of boring when you say, "Well, <laughs> everything's on the table and you can emulate it. It can play everything." That's right. But what's the quality of the actual experience? That might depend. I'm sorry, I was using something else. I was using something called the Retroid Pocket Free Plus and using Steam Link to stream from a computer to, to it because it's much more smaller. Does the Steam Link actually work for you? Because I've had both. I've tried both the discontinued, I believe, Steam Link hardware, the one you plug into your TV, and the Steam Link like mobile app. And despite having, what I, in my opinion, good home network, those things have just never been... They've been way too laggy, way too blocky. Like, I've never had a good experience with those. It wasn't laggy for me, but how about you? I, I tried Steam Link back when I was using, like, the TV, and that was... It looked like shit. You know, the, there's too much artifacts in the picture that you could automatically see it streaming, right? So yeah. I think that's the biggest issue with, with that. And it bugs the shit out of me just seeing those artifacts. I know, like, people get, you know, being a little picky about graphics, but I can't deal with artifacts. Well, the thing with my issue with the Steam Link at TV peripheral is that when I would stream, it would be a blocky one moment, a high motion scene, and then on other scenes, it would look just fine native, and I couldn't tell, but it wouldn't be consistent. That was the main issue. But it seems like, I, I, I don't know if I agree with the, the, the level, the volume of what James has in his Steam Deck article, but I do think it's re- been really handy to know that I can unshackle myself from my computer if I want to play Crisis Core Remastered or Octopath Traveler 2. I want, yeah, I, I really wonder what Valve and for like the steam next future it just makes you like you know they have a hit on their hands what the what, what are they going to do moving forward like i i i i know there are some like you know there's a good sizable audience that like wants kind of like like a steam deck slim <laughs> you know what i yeah. mean 
Oh, yeah, I was going to comment on that. I know a lot of people, one of the more common complaints that I see, I don't want to say complaint because that sounds like I'm belittling it, but that's not what I mean. One of the more common criticisms I see is that it's heavy. I kind of mm-hmm. agree that it is heavy, but I, I just know I personally like that. Like, I like the the Elite yeah. Xbox controller because you have the extra weight on it. I don't like the the Switch Pro controller because it is so light, but that's just preference. If you like a lighter controller and you really love the Switch Pro controller, the Steam Deck probably feels like a brick, <laughs> so which might not be good for people that have that preference. So yeah, Steam Deck Lite, I think, would... I say this, you know, uneducated on the, the market, and I know Steam... Valve has the research and we don't, but feels like there would be a, there'd be a, a market for a, a Steam Deck Lite. With that, we'll go into some of the headlines of the week and a couple of interesting things here. But again, as is typical of this quarter, it's a lot of a lot of dates and a lot of uh, kind of shifting schedules in terms of when we can expect things to drop this year. The one major announcement that we did get is that Wargroove 2 was announced for Switch and PC. I had completely forgotten about Wargroove that released a few a few years ago. I remember one of our contributors wrote about it because it is a strategy RPG built in the vein of like Fire Emblem or Advance Wars. And I wanted to get to it, but I never made never made time for it. So Wargroove 2, I'm glad that their initial that the initial project did well enough to merit a sequel. Yeah, I never I remember the the original kind of launched at a rough state, which initially aired me off, but I know they eventually got around to fixing it up. So I maybe I should play the first one before going to this one. Like it it always interested me, but like its launch like seemed rough to the, to people. So I, I I I was scared off and didn't come back. But I would, you know, I guess there's no reason not to get not, not to give it a shot now. So maybe when it goes on a deep discount, I will. I will say just the the one thing that is a hurdle for me is that it feels like in recent years, I know strategy RPG is a very very broad brush, but even with that broad brush, it feels a little bit crowded. There just there's, there's just a lot of there's a because especially now that we've got you know the Tactics Ogre remaster, Fire Emblem is one of Nintendo's huge series. The, the the ever-present rumor of a tactics reboot or remaster. So obviously it doesn't mean anything against the quality of what Wargroove did, but it's just it's just kind of a crowded space to, for yeah. for games to make themselves be heard. So uh, bad GRPGs are really feels like they're back in full force. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh one thing that we talked about back when you, you mentioned the Nintendo Direct from few weeks back or maybe like a month and a half back at this point in that nintendo direct one of the most surprising outcomes of it at a high level was apparently the revival of level five there was a lot of memes at the time about like the people coming out of the coffins like oh level five is back or things like that and as uh, josh and i and adam were looking at our podcast doc this week before this recording we have four headlines here that tie back to level five somehow which I would yeah. not have expected going into 2023 <laughs> that I would have four four back to back headlines. You reach for... a point where level five, well, level five has so much new shit coming out. All of a sudden, they made they had their own direct. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what the fuck? Or, I mean, like they, the level five vision has always been like a thing, but like it doesn't. It feels like it's it hasn't been re- been relevant forever until like now. So it feels like a direct because it's finally like it pertains to a worldwide audience, like. Their, their release plans and it's like they just came out swinging well what did we see brian so this is level five vision like like josh said and i wasn't really aware of this because i was never quite in as deep but we learned i guess put these headlines in any order but probably maybe the biggest one here the one i'll decide to list first is that megaton musashi wired has been announced for a worldwide 2023 release for playstation 5 playstation 4 switch and pc now i might need adam or josh's help on this Reading the press release here, this seems like this is the original Megaton Musashi game with added exclusive content, and now it's got the new subtitle wired along with it, along with the announcement. Uh, the admittedly, game. okay, so admittedly, we're, we're kind of breaking off of Gamatsu's news article for this, and they dis- describe it as, quote, an original version of the original Megaton Musashi game with additional content, end quote. I have no idea what, like, original version of the original Megaton Musashi game is, because this game, like, how do I even explain this? Megaton Musashi came out like maybe two to three years ago in Japan, only in Japan, and like it kind of wasn't well received. It's like it was a version that you paid for, and you know it had like your single player, your multiplayer stuff, and like eventually got like free updates along the line. 
But I know they eventually re-released it as a free-to-play title. Like, I forgot if it was like last year or a year and a half ago. I can't remember the timeline. And that was under a different name. It was like Megaton Musashi and then another subtitle. Uh, and uh, Silicon Era is saying Megaton Musashi X or Cross. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. And they're, they're calling Megaton Musashi Wired an updated re-release. Okay. So I assume what this means is like this is going to be something that you pay for and it's suppo- supposedly going to be like, you know, a, a better new, you know, all the additional content. I assume you know, some touch-ups to it. So, like, yeah, I never actually got around, like, playing this game. I even had a demo. I just I just kind of slept on it because I was like, eh, it's never coming out here. Like, I don't know if I... But now it's coming out here on, like, PlayStation 5, PlayStation 4, Switch, and Steam. Yeah, so, it's, so it kind of it hit two bars here. A, worldwide yeah. release. B, simultaneous PC release. Which are two bars that don't always get hit. But they're yeah. both going to be hit here. Yeah, so this is, like, kind of... Sure, sure, I guess. I mean, like, it's really funny. Like, I was looking at the trailer, and like, two things stuck out. Like, one, the damage numbers from like when the robots are fighting looks like like damage fund numbers from Xenoblade X, which is really funny. And two, like when they have like this, they had like these collaborations with like, with, like famous like robot series in the past. Like, I'm, I can't remember off the off the top of my head, but they've had they've had like I think no Ma- Mazing, like I think the original Mazinger came to it, and then like in this one, you know. They'll have Mazinger Z get a Robo, and then like how they revealed like these guest robots is kind of, kind of sort of like how like a Super Robot Wars trailer would like announce them. So they have like UFO Robot Grandizer, Combatador V, and Voltas Five. You know, so like it's apparently there's also like an anime like this is like a multi media thing for level five when they were like initially releasing it. So there's like an anime of this. Like I should probably go check out now. I have no. Uh, I have no reason not to watch it now, I guess, and like kind of get into it before it uh, releases. But like, I'm like, that's that's fucking cool. And like, sure, why not? And then, and of course, like, and like, this is this has it has crossplay between all versions between PS5, 4, Switch, and Steam. And like, that's fucking crazy, you know. So that's like, the third part that I even re- yeah. World I release simultaneous PC release complete crossplay. Yeah, it's and like the, yeah, it's like it has co-op modes where you can like like take down like big bosses or like you can uh, fight three versus three. You know, so that's I hope this game is like really fun to play. But, like my friends and I are gonna check it out. I hope the best for this game. I it's it looked cool. I just never like heard much about it, and I don't know if like if I'll like it or not. But I'm willing to give it a shot for sure. But that's that's exciting. That's kind of awesome. And then one of the other major headlines back during that initial Nintendo Direct that Level 5 apparently got revived at was this new like crime thriller RPG, Deca Police, that was on both the English and Japanese Nintendo Direct. We have a new gameplay introduction trailer for Deca Police from this Level 5, Level 5 Vision event, including a lot of character bios. The gameplay trailer both has a Japanese and an English version with a version with English subtitles, and then all of whole slew of screenshots alongside of it basically showing that it seems like uh productions it's pretty far along it's not it's not just concept art it's a lot of gameplay footage a lot of full screenshots and like i've kind of been harping on recently full screenshots with ui elements incorporated so I yeah we really like how varied the character names are in this game i, I just want to quickly go down like what the character names are here because it's like it's really cool like how varied they are like you have like harvard harvard marks Carl Oxford, then okay, child, don't fucking kill me if I mispronounce this. Zhang Xinghua, Mani Mani Manoa, which I really like. Yeah. Mikey Princeton, Granger Boston, and Messiah Cambridge. That's really cool. That's a that's a good good names for your cast. They are good, but some of them do also kind of sound like I'm playing a an off brand like baseball game, and I need this fake names for my roster it's like oh yeah that's the catcher granger boston Um, oh that was the character that has the most uh, name that pop up in my face nice i like money money manoa that's 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 another good one but yeah they they showed more you know just an extended version of like the the initial announcement trailer that they had like a, a lot more gameplay like they show a lot more of like the ui interface like during investigation bases and this like you're like 
you'll have like some parts where you'll have like a pinup board and like actually have like connect dots on like the case. There's like a really cool segment like where you're like in this turn based battle, but like what you're facing is like is like a criminal who like hiding behind a hostage. So like you kind of have to like I assume for like the, that battle like you have to like make sure like you're not hurting the hostage and whatever. And then like there there'll be like certain points like like that. It seems to be like in like some of these battles, if not all of them, like your main goal is like to cuff the individual. Like they have like these weird like 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 they throw the handcuffs like a boomerang almost <laughs> like to to, uh, uh, to to cuff them, which is weird. But okay, <laughs> I, I think that's a trope in like animes and. And movies. Uh -huh. It's like it's it's very stylish. I really hope it plays well. The, the, I think level five, like level five has this is in my mind they're kind of like monolith soft at times where like they have a really, really cool concept, but sometimes the way they execute this concept is like really fucked up. <laughs> so I sometimes not in a fun way either. <laughs> so hopefully uh, it's fun. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. Was this slated for a 2023 release, or do we? Is yeah. it up in the air? It's it's 2023 worldwide. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then one of the other games that we could that was mentioned and announced at that Nintendo Direct earlier this year that we couldn't really speak to that much was a new game in the Fantasy Life series. This was Fantasy Life I, the girl who steals time. I remember during that episode of the podcast, we kind of apologized because we couldn't really speak to the series. So that unfortunately hasn't changed. No one has educated us since then to now. Mm -hmm. but, no one knows. That, that's it. There are simply no Fantasy Life fans that, that, that listen to us. That's the big takeaway. But this is also due out in 2023. And during the Level 5 Vision event, they gave us a lot more screenshots and a big press release and trailer for Fantasy Life I, the girl who steals time. And again, I think one of the the more interesting things about this is that it's a worldwide release, just like Megaton Musashi and Deca Police. The trailer was uploaded both in Japanese and with English subtitles. So it just you, seems like you, you know you know what's the big strength of this trailer though? But then when you look at it, what is the one game that lo looks like to you right away when you skim through it? Uh Rune It Factory. looks like Animal Crossing. It looks Animal like Crossing. Animal Crossing. Yeah, yeah, it does. You show this to people and like, oh shit, I want like I want something like Animal Crossing. And they, if they look at this chair, like, oh shit, I want to get it because it looks like Animal Crossing. So, you know, this this could be like if, if you get if you like show this to people, like if it gets like a good amount of like if they if they showed this trailer like in a Nintendo Direct, like a lot of people would probably like might give it a shot because like it looks like Animal Crossing to them. I don't know if it actually is. It's like one, but like when I look, go through that trail, I'm like, that looks like Animal Crossing. And if like if a lot of people saw this trailer like in front of them forcefully, like through Nintendo, I think they would pick it up right away. <laughs> so like my, my, own, my only exposure to farming sims at all, which I deliberately did last year, was Harvestella. So I can't, that's all I can speak to. It's that, <laughs> the weird it's ass to RPG esque hybrid farm sims. It's time to buy Brian at our, uh, at our <laughs> game. A new, newest Rune Factory, whatever it's going out, three. I don't remember. But, and this is painting with a really broad brush, but yeah, it seems like all these farming sims they either are built in the vein in the image of Stardew Valley or Animal Crossing. <laughs> and I know people who have played a lot of these are like, no, that's not fair. And like, I, I, I am admitting ignorance. I don't know like how you would subdivide from there. Does anyone play the original Harvest Moon for the Super Nintendo? No. Uh, no, I've, I've laid eyes on it. I've never played it. I think the one thing that's most memorable for me is how you neglect your animals and left it to die. They'll treat you as like this fucking outcast. It's like, how dare you? You're the you're yeah. I love that sort of it's like you're like, wow, that's a really fascinating thing. I love that. <laughs> I really love that. I wonder if love... you could do this with these games, because like that is completely cut out in like later games that you, you could let your like animal die or some shit. It's I know Child's it's but... Child's like yeah, Child's like the one thing. The one bullet point that would sell me on this game is if they would let me abandon my animals. Be a complete douchebag that the <laughs> whole city hates. All right, Chow. I mean, I guess if, if that's if that's if that's what turns you on, then you know. I mean, oh. I, well, I was saying it was a feature in the old <laughs> game. It's really gone. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel you. That is that is a really fascinating concept. <laughs> now, this last game that was brought up at the level five vision event we weren't originally going to talk about but then josh was like no me and chow have to talk about this and fair enough this is for the soccer rpg so i guess it is within our purview 
Inazuma 11, Victory Road. So similar to all the other three games from level five that were brought up during the event, we got a bunch of new screenshots. We got a big uh, kind of press release detailing the, some of the gameplay and some of the mechanics. And then trailer uploaded both in Japanese and with English subtitles. Yeah, so what we- uh, this this game has been like in development hell for like the last like I want to say like five to like six years, if maybe seven at this point. It's been a long time. Like they they keep talking about this Inazuma Eleven game, and like it's been very on and off, and like we didn't know it was gonna get a little more release to like right now. But like uh, there's been Inazuma Eleven releases in the past, like on like 3ds, but I don't know when was the last time we've seen this. We've seen a new one in the uh, in the West. Like I, I can't I say like a bit. Oh, no. I thought I thought I thought I thought, it, I thought at least like like one or two made it to the West. I thought I don't know. I don't is it remember the DS days. Maybe it is. Maybe I'm so out of the loop that maybe it's the DS days. I remember seeing one of them in English, but maybe I'm fucking crazy. I thought that's totally, totally something that can't be Googleable. That just uh, it's just impossible. Let's just try to sell me on in the Zuma Eleven. What what is the concept of this? Game? I mean, is it, 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 it challenge soccer turn into RPG? It it, it, it is sort of like you know. Uh, Oh god, what was the name of that? Um, fuck, I forgot what it was called. Like the, the over the top like anime like there's another over the top anime soccer thing. It's not Blue Lock. It's like Blue Lock. Like, that's oh. yeah, so, like, yeah. It's like Captain uh, Tsukasa Tsubasa. I forgot what. It's sort of like that, but like sort of somehow even more anime <laughs> than that. <laughs> um, but it's because like they're, they're, Can I they're, cut they're, in real quick here. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. The most recent Inazuma Eleven game was Inazuma 11 3. It came out in Europe, but not North America. Oh, okay, there we go. That's the reason why. I'm, like, wow. I, was, I was like, I'm pretty sure I saw one of these in English, but I didn't. there you go. One of those really weird releases where it's only European and not North America. Thank you for clarifying. And but also, yeah, looks, like, looks like the same for Inazuma 11 2 on DS. Um, it looks like <laughs> America did get the original Inazuma 11. <laughs> oh, we got that. Oh, never mind, okay. Okay. There's four Inazuma 11 games. The original game came out on DS in in Europe. It did eventually come out in America, I guess, as a digital title for like the 3DS shop. Oh, Very okay. Strange. strange. Huh. That's bad. Yeah, there's no way I could have kept up, but like, I could remember that. Apparently, America just uh, can't deal with football. Well, America hates soccer, to be honest with you. They'll be like, what the hell is this shit? It's so boring. Like, what? I love watching soccer. It's great. It's the most but popular yeah. sport for a reason. But yeah, like that, like this game has like like some people like like sprout like angel wings to like for for their shot chow, for example. Yeah, yeah. play on your team. So yeah, it's a, it's definitely one of those games where like you you build up a team, you fucking uh, build up their stats. It's it's very like I can't say that like the gameplay will like speak to everyone, but uh, if you do get into it, people get real super into it because it's it's not like you're kind of like more like planning your moves more so than like actively like playing like the game you know you're kind of like kind of like you're a lot of arrows and pointing your character towards like how you approach the, the ball and how you pass how you shoot but it's not like you're it's not like it's not like super active control from what i recall because i could be wrong or like misremembering like how recent titles are um this one seems to be a very very crazy endeavor with victory road because like they have this um they have this mode where like you can like re basically relive like almost every like past inazuma 11 like game or property like they're advertising that this game include like like when you include all the characters from different versions and release and season passes like they're including like over 4500 characters from the series past in this game jesus <laughs> it's like what the f- like and you're like reliving like some of like the biggest like you know highlights and like games of, like in the past that's like i don't know like uh, this game has been in development for a really long time. I, I don't know. End up like Dead or Alive DLCs, where the DLC, if you include all of it, it's like over like a thousand dollars. Oh yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? But yeah, and then like, the, and then there's like there's there's animation in it, like anime scenes, like produced by Mappa. You have like a whole new like cast of like you know characters as well, and their own single player story. It's like they It seems to be like they're really, really going all out with this Inazuma Eleven more so than like most previous ones. I, I don't know, there's something about this that makes me go, I should try to, like, give this, like, game a real shot. And, like, it seems to be pretty fucking big. But I I don't know. But I'm kind of scared, too. Like, because I've never really, like, got super deep in Zuma 11. I've only, like, seen it from the sideline as well. But that's 
That that's crazy. That I, I didn't think this would get like a, a global release, and now that we've like we've seen like now that Adam has educated us on how the past games have been distributed, it's like yeah, this seems to be like a really big pivotal moment for this series. Or like, if if done really well, and like and you get in this feel like this is something that like it finds its audience. Like hopefully it finds like a big audience. It has a, a chance to like explode because this game has been very popular in Japan. You know, it really it's really been really popular there for many many years i wonder if this is like its chance to shine now on a global scale that'd be really cool to see that covers all the headlines from the level five vision event so four games all slated for 2023 all slated for worldwide releases at least a yeah. couple of them coming out for pc all their well, trailers rpgs being... at least like you know there's also oh, yeah, for yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, that, but that's not an rpg but hey, hey latent fans they're finally making one in america Mm-hmm. We're finally there, so that's cool to see. Yeah, level five. I'm still. I don't know where the fuck level five is. Like finding the money to like, like just have oh, global geez. releases for like how many new games? <laughs> There's like yeah, a lot. Well, has to be. I mean, I mean, no, but the MMO is like, isn't most of that money going to Netmarble? Like, I don't know. I- but... I'm sure they get royalties from it. I mean, they're using their you know the IP technically, isn't it? I mean. Uh, yeah, I guess I, I maybe they see, but uh, probably don't really... get all the profits. <laughs> I, I, obviously, but it, that's sub enough to like enough to like do this. I don't fucking know that. Like, I can understand like maybe Nintendo's helping them like for Deca Police, for instance, and marketing that. But yeah, I don't know. This still seems like a lot, a lot of fucking money to like just give global releases to like a whole bunch of like new console titles and many of them multi-platform as well. Wow, wow. Good yeah. luck, level five. This this is definitely like one of those. I'm not gonna say make it or break it moments for level five because they're they're good at like surviving, but like this is one of those things. Is like this is like their first real chance in many many years to like kind of be super relevant again and like in like modern gaming, I guess. When's Yokai Watch? I don't know, man. I don't know. From what I've been hearing, like Yokai Watch is Yokai Watch is an IP that's like really fell off in Japan in re- recent years. I like, heard, uh, like more popular than Pokemon at one point. Yeah, it was more popular. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but yeah, I don't know. For, I guess I don't know what happened. Like, like I have a like several friends in Japan that like the like like the sentiment about like Yokai Watch is an IP in Japan these days is like is like it will give you like an ugly look when like you mentioned like, like Yokai. It's like oh, it's like oh Yokai Watch. <laughs> it literally made me laugh. Like, man, what did they do? Like, yeah, what the fuck happened? <laughs> so, huh? Well, they no longer should rely on Yokai Watch to bankroll everything. So, a few other major headlines here before we go into like our release date and delay rundown. And this one has spurred a a lot of conversation I've seen on Twitter, on some forums, on Reddit. And that is, is that Square Enix has released their quarterly financials. Uh, that you from a, not quite what? Not quite. All right, take it away, Adam. Okay. So Square Enix actually released these financials about a month ago, but the Square Enix, compared to all other companies, it takes them forever to get the translation out. So that's why this is showing up now. Uh, this data, or this presentation, was given, like I said, a month ago, and I'm sure people reported on it, but there's not a lot in English because the, the translation wasn't out yet. But yeah, anyways, they put out the translation this weekend, a couple days ago. <laughs> And basically, so this what this this is just a regular quarterly financials meeting. They do this every quarter, every three months. Every company does in capitalistic societies. And he, they they basically were explaining. Well, we're talking about the quarter from October to December. That's quarter three of the fiscal year, of course, plus all the stuff that came before it. And then also, since these presentations are you know they're delayed, this was given at the end of the very beginning of February. Forspoken had just released, so even though Forspoken from Square Enix wasn't technically released in the financials that they were talking about, that's going to be the next quarter. They're going to talk about that in April. They, you know, took the opportunity to talk about it here because why not? So they basically said two things about their HD games that were notable. One, again, this this presentation is given about a week after Forspoken released. They said the sales to Forspoken were lackluster. And the reviews were challenging. We don't have any other like context to like how many sales or, or you know, exactly how close or how far away from their expectations it sales are. 
They're, they're, quote, lackluster. That is the word that they used officially in the translation. So take that as you will. And then as for the games actually released last year, they basically said this. The HD games section of their financials is down year on the year, year over year, because many of the small and mid-sized titles that they had released haven't, haven't met expectations, wherever those expectations were. Now, they didn't specify any particular game as an underperformer or any game as an overperformer, really. All they said was kind of cumulatively, many of these titles did not meet expectations. So I reported on this, and you know, I listed a handful of the games they released, not even all of them, in the last year, like quarter two, quarter three, that you know could plausibly count as mid to small size titles. So like Valkyrie Elysium, The Dio Field Chronicles, Star Ocean, Tactics Ogre, Crisis Core. I'm sure, I'm missing several. Harvestella, Harvestella. Yeah, there's a bunch, and it sounds like so Square Enix in this fiscal year didn't have any major release. And by this fiscal year, I mean like since last April to next April. They don't really have any big, like, AAA game. But I'm trying to think, like, what is their biggest game? Crisis Core, maybe? Probably, That's just probably the Crisis Core, yeah. <laughs> Technically, right? Like, you know, obviously it's got that, it's kind of riding the wave of Final Fantasy Remake, but it really is just a remaster. So it seems like their strategy this year, while they're still in the works for like Final Fantasy 16 is next fiscal year, Final Fantasy 7 Remake 2 is next fiscal year, and then obviously further down the line, Kingdom Hearts 4, Dragon Quest 12, and whatnot. It seems like their strategy this year was to release a bunch of those small size games with Forspoken being hopefully their big AAA game. But that didn't seems like those neither of those things have passed have panned out so far. So uh, now it, it, it didn't pan out to the point that they're like, OK, we're just like dissolving luminous productions and like putting it into our company. We're just folding that and like uh, absorbing it into them. into Square Enix proper. There's yeah. lots of poor decision over the last year with their games like they're, they release so close to each other with like next to zero marketing. It's like, how the hell do you expect any of these games to sell? And then, so, first of all, I want to say that. Um, since this presentation was given, which again was about a month ago, it just takes that long for the translation to come out. They have since released Final Bar Line, Theater Rhythm, and Octopath Traveler 2. And both those games have at least both those games have reviewed well, but you know, we don't know yet. I have really much indication of and I'm sure there's like Japan sales charts, but you know, that's obviously just a very small chunk of the pie. Like how well are those doing overall? We'll we'll find out next quarter when they talk about them. I want to note that like the original Octopath Traveler, I think, sold around three million, and that might have even been before it came to PC. So it's a pretty good success story. And it's, even though Octopath Traveler Two, in many people's eyes, has, is improvement on the first, you know, as a critically as a game, it's like, will it Not reach the same sales potential? Who knows? So we'll see. But uh, yeah, as, as, as for Chow's point, Obviously, they released, like, I think if you count all of them, it was literally literally like 20 titles last year. And, you know, when you have that many, it's hard to dedicate. I'm not trying to make excuses for Square Enix, but they had to market all of these titles all at the same time. And, you know, I think it kind of left, like, them all almost shortchanged, you know, because they had to just do so much. And so each game got, like, a blog post or a trailer. Yeah. But that was about it. So. <laughs> But uh, one tough. thing I want to bring up with Octopath too is like it's only doing like mild success compared to original. There's a lot of things that, that I was gonna say about it. It's like it's like why is this also on the PS5 when the first game was not released oh. on the PlayStation platform? It's such uh, a dumb idea. It's like it's like it's on Xbox. It's, it's actually not- it's actually an interesting point you bring up. Let me pull up the actual outline here because they actually they're. So at the end of all of these sorts of investor presentations, they take Q&A, right? Questions and answers. And one of the investor questions literally was kind of pointing at this sort of like platform strategy that Square Enix has. And what I'm getting at is like Square Enix, we all know they have a bunch of like timed exclusives or Epic Store exclusives or staggered platform releases or whatnot, right? You see that all the time from Square Enix more than like any other company that's not a, you know, first party even. So literally the question was, what is your platform strategy for your forthcoming new titles? And the answer that's was... That's honestly a great question. The answer was, we intend to maintain the multi-platform strategy we have adopted to date. So <laughs> some reading between the lines there. Like, first of all, why was that question asked? Like, more specifically, are they wondering about, like, timed releases and things like that? And then the answer is just like, we 
intend to maintain the strategy. Like, does that mean they're still going to be doing these sort of staggered timed exclusives, epic releases, you know, games like Octopath, the first one not being on PlayStation and on Xbox, but the second one kind of being the opposite? Who knows? <laughs> yeah, I, I think it would sell better as a Nintendo exclusive because Nintendo would do the marketing for you, technically, right? I mean, but, 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 but also, like, I wouldn't just want the Octopath to just be on Switch. I'd be like, I'll I know, the PC release. Like, yeah, I, so much better. But, I mean, there's also a lot of external factors, like you know, like sure, like yes, the the, the Nintendo marketing may be a factor in it. But hey, remember Octopath was revealed in a Nintendo Direct, you know, and it, it got in front of people's eyes from the get go immediately. It's also you know, think about this: HD 2D is not a novel thing anymore visually, and people and people generally know what they're getting into in Octopath. And for you know, a significant amount of people, it's like. They didn't really like the 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 direction that Octopath went in. Ultimately, like when they when they played it, like there there could be like it's not it's not crazy to think about. It happens with every almost everything that like game sequel will inevitably like usually sell less than the original. You know, that's not a crazy concept to think about. <laughs> it's not crazy, but I just think it's it would have done better as an exclusive, in my opinion. That's how... I I don't think it would have changed much. To be honest, I would rather have it like how, how it is right now much rather be playing it well, I, play right now i i think of, i think the well is a little poisoned because octopath one did eventually come to pc so if octopath 2 was switch exclusive you'd exactly. have people, you'd have people say like well i'll just wait for pc the first one came to pc uh yeah I, that's me i would have i would not have bought, fucking bought it <laughs> bah, 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 bah. triangle strategy i'm like i'm not getting this until it comes to pc yeah yeah bah, 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 bah. you see when you never know you never know well and then yeah i don't i don't know how much squares pull it out of a hat release thing is i don't know if that really helps or hurts much but it just it's frustrating for coverage for sure like kingdom hearts change your paradise are still stuck on epic for some reason for, for whatever reason neo the world ends with you was the one of the ones that did make its way to steam but like with no it was like I'm shadow really, almost like a shadow drop like we're I, think, I think i think one of like the unique ones here because uh, like you know paranormal site is published by square enix and like the plan for that is there's switch pc and mobile devices and like they're actually really, like, this is a premium title on mobile device that you like you pick up for sixteen bucks. And like obviously mobile is a tremendous market in Japan. Like I wonder if the Japanese market will like if it'll sell well. Like obviously Switch sells well, so I really wonder how well Paranormal Site will do in the Japanese market. Not only just a released on Switch, but also like as a premium mobile title. Like is that something that like and that still be successful in Japan? That actually like, reminds me how like almost every single saga remaster ends up on mobile and keeping yeah. so long. Like did anyone play this on mobile? Like I wonder how it's feasible at all. Like even Scarlet Grace made it to mobile, right? Even the last remnant is on mobile. Oh, I can really? barely imagine that. Like, that's I, so Okay, that's sick. <laughs> I want to try it on mobile now. <laughs> Adam, you should try that. You should try that on mobile. Fantasy tactics are on mobile, okay? <laughs> That's so funny. I, I did not know the last round was on the board. I just totally forgot. Honestly, that's funny. But yeah, we we uh, yeah, we yeah. all lived it's, it basically. And you can currently buy on mobile, but you can't buy it on Steam. <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. Square is so awesome. <laughs> I love the it makes sense. I love the consistency. It's it's great. We all lived yeah, it last like, year. We talked about how all the uh, all the square coverage like was was tricky to navigate I, I like i don't know i guess i guess you don't really have any big square things to like 16 right like from here on out i don't think uh, let me look at their press site it's paranormal site was the most recent one yeah so i'm trying to think like any other square releases like from now till like 16 and that's just what so we're thinking about like is there anything in late oh, march April? i'm looking at their press site and first of all their press site needs to be updated mm -hmm. um Final Fantasy oh, is 16 is the only one with a date. And then there is Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth next winter. All right. And there's a couple on here that they need to update. But then there's a couple that are just TBA, which is Dragon Quest 3 Remake, Kingdom Hearts 4, Kingdom Hearts Missing Link, Dragon Quest Adventures of Dai, Dragon Quest 12, Dragon Quest Keshi Keshi, which is one of those like puzzle games. Oh, yeah. Oh, Let's go. <laughs> Bubble Bubble 4 Friends. Did that ever come out? Oh, shit. Is that is that? Is is that, 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 that I, th I thought that, yeah, that's like a Steam. Wow, oh, that's that's weird. Uh, I don't know if that has a release date, but I think I think that's coming to Steam, right? I uh, let me see. Is this kind of Taito? Well, yeah, Taito Square Enix owns Taito. Yeah. So Bubble Bubble looks like it came out 
in, on Switch in 2020, so it's been a while. Oh, okay, I mean, yeah, then, then this kind of, this came out last September or 2021 September in Steam on Steam. So here, let me let me let me do a let me give you a screenshot of this of this release list and you'll see there's a couple out here that are very outdated like uh they need to oh i can't wait to see this i only got one thing to say taito has the best boot up screen ever catch your hot though i know oh yeah yeah <laughs> if Final Fantasy Fantasy 13 stormblood why is Final Fantasy 13 stormblood on here Final Fantasy 13 series is still going i guess <laughs> hell yeah uh, there are, did they publish did they publish dying light too i wasn't expecting that yeah or in Okay. Japan? Oh, is it in the UK? I thought they also did it in Japan. I don't know. But yeah. So I mean, you know, well, I guess, I guess realistically, the, the next thing we're uh, looking forward to their square in terms of releases is 16, because that's the only one of the day. Oh, wait, wait, wait. We forgot about Front Mission. Well, that's technically mm-hmm. not published by Square. Mm-hmm. That's uh, it's originally their IP, but it, like these remakes are not under them. That's always very strange. It's not, yeah. even, it's not even like one of those, it's technically not even one of those like, like Triangle Strategy or or Live Alive, which those are like published by Square in Japan and published by Nintendo in the West. These Front Mission games are like completely forever entertainment. Like Square Enix basically just said, "Here's the IP, do it with you, do what you want." So, all right, we gave you the perfect segue, Brian. Did we? Let me pull up. Speaking of Front Mission, there's a couple of games, including well, there's a game also called oh. Front Mission Two. Yeah, but that's I have I have the releases in chronological order. You're gonna make me mess it up. Okay, <laughs> Damn. Wow. it's over. <laughs> All right. Well, well, we'll go ahead and do it. I will. I will. I'll be flexible. All right. So. Obviously, late last in November, during all the deluge of all the releases, including all the Square releases, we did have Quentin write up a review for the Front Mission remake, and now we have a date for the Front Mission Two remake. It launches for Nintendo Switch on June twelfth. So this was originally announced at the. September Nintendo Direct last year. At, at the time, they re- they revealed that the first remake was going to come out by the end of the year, and I believe the next two were listed just generic 2023. But now we know that Front Mission 2 is coming to Nintendo Switch on June 12th. I don't think anyone here has played the second one, because there was like no English version of it. I played the second one. I didn't play it in English. But I, took, uh, yeah. <laughs> but I played the second one. Yeah, yeah. 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 I think. I, I, I like to. So, well, did anyone here play the Front Mission One remake? I did. I didn't play the remake. I, played the uh-huh. the I, I played the remake, but like if Front Mission One is a very dry game in my opinion. It's very basic. It's, a, it's like it's okay at like establishing the concepts, but to me, it's not a very interesting game. Two Two is much better on that front, and like the trailer for it is very promising because that trailer is in sixty FPS. So it stands to reason that this so this game will be in sixty FPS, unlike the. First game's remake, which was it annoyed me that it wasn't 60 FPS, especially when the fucking original release was in much smoother frame rate. I think it was in 60. So that annoyed me about it. So yeah, That's Front Mission cool. 2 remake, you know, it looks really it, it looks really nice. Uh, say, so really... say again why you think two remake will be 60? Or are you just yeah. hoping so, that it is? Oh, the trailer I mean, is. Yeah, it's in the trailer in 60. I mean Okay, maybe the YouTube version isn't, but like when I direct downloaded it from the Dropbox for the press site, it was in sixty. I never actually played the I never actually played the YouTube version until now. But the one that you could download on their on their Dropbox site was in sixty FPS. Gotcha. What the fuck? That's <laughs> I'm not, yeah, I'm now skimming to this fucking YouTube version, and it's not seemingly <laughs> not in sixty. What the fuck? Did I get duped? Yes. Are they are they lying to me to their Dropbox version because their Dropbox? Uh, Instead of a bull shot, it's a bull video. Uploaded, maybe they just uploaded it to YouTube pro- improperly. I mean, like this when it's just recorded from not using the actual hardware. Oh my god, I'm gonna be so mad now if this is like they just like decided to light them even their Dropbox version. It's not actually in 60. I thought like I okay, it's totally normal for me to think that their Dropbox version was gonna be the one going up on YouTube, but I guess not. I mean, like it seems to be the same footage, but like half the frame rate for whatever reason. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anymore. What the fuck? Okay, now I'm scared again. If this game's not in 60, I'm gonna be mad again. It'll it'll need the uh the Switch Pro in order or the Switch 2 in order to play it at 60. I'm never gonna forgive the Switch. I'm never gonna forgive Nintendo. One of the other last major pieces of news comes from the Japanese side of things. We talked about Nice America's localizations of the Falcom titles, Trails to Azure, Trails into Reverie, and Nayuta Boundless Trails. 
And then Josh did mention that there was also some new news about East 10 Nordics. So East 10 Nordics was announced by Falcom late last year in December. No official English marketing for this game yet. At the time, we just saw a little bit of, of a few screenshots. We saw a little bit of news about like when this takes place in the timeline. There was the, about the boat, the like, ship driving mechanics, which of course people took a few laughs at. And of course, this dual protagonist system with Adol and at the time, this other, I believe at the time, nameless character. People kind of speculated based on the art, how it might work. And we got a few new details from Falcom this week, along with new character art and a lot of new screenshots. Uh, there's a lot of details that, the, that they released for this, like even including like how the battle system works in this game between like the solo and the combination mode. I got to see an action. No, I, yeah. It's really hard to describe something. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I guess we'll, we'll bring it down. Like First, we like, finally got like the one, and we finally got the character designs for Adol, and then the mysterious heroine's name is... Uh, I don't know if it's Karha or Karja Varta. I have no idea if that the J is... Uh, like, you pronounce, pronounce the, the J in, uh, in Karha. Uh, I guess... Supposed to be very Viking Norse themed, so maybe it's just Karma. Yeah, I wasn't exactly sure. So you know, the, obviously a- Adol is back with his one-handed sword, but then uh, Karha supposedly her Karha. He has like a like a hatchet and round shield like for her weapons. And we we did see that like the character designs are by the uh, Toy Eight, and you may recognize them for, as the character designer from Tokyo Mirage Sessions and I Am Setsuna. All right, Chow, the, the, let's hear it. Why do you fucking hate these character designs? I don't know. This alien looks so <laughs> It's It's like he has de-aged like, in their five years. Well, this is technically in the timeline. It's supposed to be, I think, right after Adol leaves East. So he's supposed to be like 17. Yeah, yeah. Before, still 17. yeah it's like after right one and two. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he looks even younger than his one and two counterpart. And speaking of uh, Kara, it says Karja and Katakana. Okay. Yeah, but I think- how do you pronounce the J? It's just Jay. Katakana. It says Jay. Oh, yeah, okay. I, I did see the katakana in front of me. I just have it on Gimatsu's site. They don't have it in katakana. So if it's Karja, then it's Karja. So. Uh, what I'll say is that I, I what I did on my browser window here is that I pulled up the art of Karja, then I pulled up the art of Laxia, and then I pulled up the right art of Karna from East 4. Uh-huh. And, I'm just, and I'm, I'm just like, I kind of wish these, just in general, like all these character designs are fine, and I'm sure they'll be fine. But if you ask me to like, what was Karna's personality versus what was Laxia's personality versus, and I just like, I don't, I barely remember. Like, I almost just wish there was a little bit more continuity. That's the that's the that's 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 games for you. Like, that's 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 legacy of like like a, like East heroines in general, right? And like, <laughs> like I'm sure Karja will be fine, but is she going to be memorable? Like, I barely. Well, remember. I mean, my uh, my opinion, my my broad opinion here is that a lot of the characters in like most of the party system east games are not very good with the exception of like donna because she yeah. had to be at least you know she's you know the, the basically is her story except that was one stronger element of east nine is i thought the party characters there were at least a notch above what they had been uh, but otherwise like when i'm talking about doll and raging bull and hawk or whatever his name was <laughs> his, his superhero name but uh cool. But you don't yeah, like we'll you don't like work. Grandpa Fisherman from Eight. I don't remember his story or <laughs> what he did. Know. Saha is it? Is it? Is yeah, that? Sala, Sada, Sahad. Man, and, or any of the characters from E Seven, like any of the playable characters, like. But, but no matter what, I, I am positively hyped for this game because I could finally get rid of that party system. Good yeah, God, Ritz. Yeah, Chow is cheering that the party system is yeah, no yeah. more at least for me. i'm with them so yeah they, they kind of break down like you know obviously they've announced before that this game will have a daddy like maybe only two playable characters we don't know if like Karjo's always with you as your secondary character or not you don't know that yet but it seems right now there's there used to be only two playable characters at any given time in this game so in solo mode uh obviously like you play either adol or karja and then yeah you can swap to the character at any time in the uh, solo mode you have like a dash you know it's a, it seems to be pretty basic you know you, but uh, like the real sauce to, for me is like you can with the press of a button you can go from solo to common combination mode combination mode is more offense focused you do a lot more damage uh and, and combination mode this is actually where you can like guard so guard like in solo mode you can only dash but like you actually have a dedicated like guard action in combination mode Flash guard so that, that that's the thing that that 
doesn't work like flat flash guard or flash dodge anymore in this one. So when you guard attack enemy attacks, your revenge gauge increases, and you, you can a- activate skills uh, using your uh, your revenge gauge meter. And then like when you when you guard a uh, power attacks, like the attacks of the red aura from enemies, like you can repel them like like just guard, but you're not but, like in an invincible state. You kind of like just kind of like push them back almost. It looks like from the screenshots. There's nothing in this game that seems to indicate that like flash guard or or, uh, or flash dodge is like coming back as like mechanics to like kind of just like break the game open and make it kind of monotonous. When they first announced this game, I think we, when we discussed it. We said it almost feels like has a little bit of like character action game influence to it. You know, mm-hmm. not quite, but yeah. you know, more of this like timing. And I know all East games have like timing mechanics, but a little bit more on like the action combat gameplay with guarding mechanics and meters and things versus just you know like the party system skills and you know party composition stuff so it's obviously that's not really a factor anymore you just have basically one character or two and some leeway there but yeah it's it's a little bit of a different flavor and i'm like you know like Gao said it's very interesting to, to do that you know versus you know having another party based Action yeah, I, I can't wait to see this game in action when they see like a trailer with like gameplay footage. Like, I really, really want to see this game in action. It looks, it looks really good. Like, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic for this. And like, not to say that like the like I didn't enjoy the party based these games. Like, I li- I like seven, eight, and nine just uh you know quite a lot. But like, like you four know. games, it's like pretty much overstated. It's yeah, yeah. After, yeah. after four games in a row, it just kind of like let's try something new. Yeah, so this is this is definitely something new, you know, <laughs> for sure. So, so and then, when and then, do you uh, Falcon trail, trailers? Is it from their investment meetings usually? I mean, this is this game's coming out like well, I don't know if there's like a, a release date, but like it's definitely going to be like you know last week of September. So I, I imagine I don't know. Like, Falcom, I, I don't keep on Falcom's like Falcom schedule. Is, Falcom has always been historically weird with trailers. They're better. Yeah. But I remember. When now this is several years ago now, but I remember Tokyo Xanadu when that was first announced. They like refused to release a trailer for it. They just like would never release a trailer. They released a bunch of updates, a bunch of screenshots, but it would never release a trailer. And then the actual first like game footage we got of it, like in motion, was from a commercial. Yeah, I was gonna say like it's probably gonna be like we'll probably see this game in motion like from a web commercial that will drop. Yeah, out like fifteen around. second commercial. Yeah, like, you're going, oh, holy <laughs> shit, you know. And, and then usually, usually the trailer isn't like short. Like you know, it's usually like maybe like, maybe a week at most after the web commercial. I, mm-hmm. I feel like, but oh, whenever the web commercial drops from between now and when it releases, you'll you'll know the trailers shortly after. <laughs> I just don't like watching their gameplay like you know demonstration with I think like the producer and their. Was it oh, like when they had like trade shows? Yeah, I don't like those those trailers because it'll be like I'm using like the super move and gas will always go on like Sugoi, Sugoi, and like any fucking Japanese trade show, like a little bit. It's like, oh man, dude, <laughs> hey, I hate those demonstrations. I don't know what your game's about, but if you're going off like this, man, we should go, we should go to Tokyo Game Show, Chow, and then we could be, we could be those people. Yeah. No, don't tilt the stick up. I will see the character in motion. I'm like, oh, so good. So good. <laughs> I'll get fucking kicked out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> dude, I would talk to do it ironically because I can't stand that either. <laughs> so I guess I have to ask, when do you think we'll see East 10? Early 2024? When I say we, oh, I guess no I mean West. the West. Yeah. <laughs> Early 2024 is uh, very optimistic, I would say. Um, hmm. You know what? Like realistically, I would probably say fall twenty twenty four. Gotcha. That's what I think. Uh, okay. uh, I also have one question. I never played Use Nine on Lock. I was going to ask: Was there any like localization issues with Nine? When no, it's pretty interesting. It was definitely a big step up from Use Eight at launch. So no, no. So the only thing that like they did patch out on day one, but like my experience was kind of tarnished a little bit because uh, East Nine had like this crashing bug on on playing it on PlayStation Five, but that's only like during pre release. They came out, they patched that. So there was actually like, legit like game breaking bugs that like I kind of suffered through, but like I, I didn't know whether they're going to patch it on day one or not. But they did. But that was like the only issue, which is bad. But hey, the, at least I, my my experience wasn't representative of like the final copy that like the average person was. Thanks for playing. putting your suffering for everybody else. Yeah. yeah. But you know, I mean, like East Stein, it's a fine game. It's a fun game. You know, the movement abilities throughout that town when you're like, you're kind of like, have like those superhero abilities. With the party, like they were fun, but like, like we, like we said, like it was definitely time to like mix it up. Like, like 
we're talking if you were talking about East Ten now it was a party based game, I'd be like, man, I don't know. <laughs> I, I would definitely be random aside, but I remember for our game of the year discussion that year, East uh-huh. Nine did not make our top ten. Mm-hmm. We got nudged out of it. And I remember we did get a comment, someone was like, I'm confused. Where's East where's East Nine? Did you not consider it? And I felt bad. Like, uh, well, we did, but it didn't make it to the top ten. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, hey, you got they gotta listen to the deliberations. So you'll know it was there. You'll have to listen to like five hours of it. <laughs> it was there. But yeah. We'll see. East Ten, I'm excited. I'm excited. I think it looks a lot better in the screenshots than I kind of agree with the child. The two D art is just a bit different. I think I think I'll acclimate to it a little bit, but it is just different. Yeah, this is like also considering that this is on Falcom's new engine that they you know laid out at first using the first Kuro game. So you know moving forward, they've been all using this new engine, and I think that it's, it's been working out for them. You know, I, I thought I thought it would be it would be a rougher start, but like it seems it seems like their games have like really just benefited like immediately from the get go. I'm sure like they've they optimized it obviously for Kuro too. But like, like when I think about like like uh, a developer that like not not like a triple A developer or anything, just like a, a more like smaller developer developer like Falcom making like their own in house arbitrary engine, like I kind of get worried because of like I'm like man, game development is really really fucking rough these days, and it's like it's costly, it's expensive, and like and like to develop games using your own in house engine instead of like something like Unreal or something that's like well documented. Uh, like I had my worries, but. Falcom is somehow pulling through. <laughs> Before I get into the release dates, there's a few other trailers that we had released in the last week. One of which is we talked about the announcement of Cry Machina. This is a like a spiritual successor follow up to from the developers of Cry Star. Uh, we had a anime animated opening that was released over a week ago, and now uh, we have about like 30 minutes of gameplay footage that apparently you took a look at, Josh. Oh yeah, the Cry Machina gameplay, like uh, you know, mm-hmm. this is like a new game that uh you announced uh about by Akuria. There there was like a I guess a, a live stream for it like showing like the very beginning of the game. Uh it's uh it's like an action RPG and like the, a lot of like the, the tweaks that you can make to your character are like these little accessory things that kinda look like wings at your back or kinda look like fin funnels from Gundam. So it it, it looks like heavily stylish and very fast action. Like from like the very beginning of the game, like your character has like twenty five thousand HP. It's like okay, what the fuck is going on? And you know, it didn't show much of like more of the game outside of like the tutorial bits of the game. But like, it looks it looks pretty fast paced. The movement seems nice. The one animation thing that I really liked from this uh, gameplay is like the, there's like slopes that you can slide down. Like the animation for it is like they use like your fin funnel wings as like a surfboard to like go down the slope, which was really funny and like kind of like out of nowhere and. Uh, but uh, there's like some generic like you know enemy designs that like you used to beat up as like, the tutorial and i was like i was looking at it with some friends i was like you know what these enemy designs for some reason like kind of remind me for like godfall for some reason and then they're like you know what you know what they remind us of or like what like they look like two human enemy designs. like oh my god you're right. <laughs> you're not wrong so, now i know the original game i star mm-hmm. i haven't played it but i know reading I believe Lucas's review of it back when, and a lot of one of the biggest criticisms of the game was that like it felt like it was extremely low budget to the point that it had like a lot of repetition in like environments and even in the narrative it would have like an excuse for you to like replay half the game for some reason. It's like part of the narrative quirk of the game, but apparently it just like was not implemented very well at all, and it, he called it a drag. Right. So, uh, hopefully, this game kind of avoids that issue. I, I have I have no idea. Like, like I mean, uh, those longer, uh, those long, longer, like structural things are really hard to see. You know. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, but, but like, even like, I don't know. Like, I've never played Crystar. I don't know. Like, how this relates to Crystar. I'm like, I'm like thinking, should I play Crystar before? Like, I'm kind of sort of interested to play this game, but I don't know. Fifth one almost sold me. Almost, almost. <laughs> see, yeah, see, yeah. <laughs> even Chow's like, mm. <laughs> okay, uh, okay. New Gundam is my favorite Gundam of all. Uh-huh. It's like it's it's too badass of a Gundam. You're telling me this thing has fin funnels? Uh, like, yeah, I mean that's a big quirk of the game. Yeah, so you know it's like an action RPG, it's like Devil May Cry s but with fin funnels. It's like like the main thing that you're customizing. Like, hey, hey, don't worry, Chow, I'm with you. Like. Maybe, maybe I'll like this game. I don't know, but but I don't know if like if I have to like play Crystar first or not, or if this has any story ties to Crystar. I don't know. I'm too uninformed. 
they've only just been marketing it mostly as like from the team that made Crystar. So hasn't my perception it hasn't been marketed as a direct sequel or anything like that. How many it years like a follow been, up? How many years has it been since Crystar? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I, my ballpark guess is at least six years. Wow. Crystar uh, came out on Switch more recently. Two thousand eighteen. I was there. See, five years. I was so close. Last uh, major update that we have is that we got a new trailer for the upcoming Metal Mega Man Battle Network Legacy Collection, uh, including some details and some of the features that were going to be included into this uh, collection. Buster yeah. Max mode, which mm-hmm. is, it seems like it's a mode that basically just makes it super easy. Everything does a hundred times as much damage as you normally would. And then it looks like there, and I don't know the history of Battle Network, but it seems like there's this feature called patch cards that were incorporated into Battle Network 4 and onwards. Yeah, yeah. so so basically for, on the first one of Buster Max mode, this only, this mode only like, it powers up your default Mega Buster weapon by 100 times. So it still makes it easy mode, but you don't have to like rely on any cards, just the default Mega Buster weapon. So if you're just, you just want to breeze by to see the story, it's, it's just there, there for that. Obviously it's disabled for online battles. So it's just it's just mainly like hey if you want to see the story if because like there's a lot of games in this collection and you just want to breeze by like the earlier titles or something then use that. I will actually defer to um, Kite made a really great write up about or no not not Kite uh, Josh Tol- the Tolentino from Silicon Era uh, made a great write up about uh, the the patch cards known as mod cards uh, about ma- uh, that they were laying out in this Mega Man Battle Network. So they were uh, like patch cards or physical cards. Where you could buy and then scan it to the game using Nintendo's e-reader hardware add-on uh, for this game. So that was like a big thing back then, obviously. So like they they would swipe a patch card and then like the like to kind of like emulate like you like doing the motion in real life to like activate a card like in game. Um, so for for this release, they're just like bringing all all 199 patch cards, including all the special and rare ones that will just be available in the game itself. You can turn them on or off in battles. There's also some. Um, there's also might be some collaboration cards that I don't know if they're going to have all the collaboration, but there will be some collaboration cards uh, still intact in the game. So, you know, shout outs to uh, Josh Tolentino's uh, reporting on that in Silicon Era on reminding me like how mod cards worked in this game. And yeah, it just seems to be like the amount of effort Capcom is made is putting into this Mega Man Battle Battle Network collection is like pretty freaking insane so they're just like continuing to like prove to people that like yeah we're we're taking this seriously and you know never bother us about really re-releasing battle network ever again <laughs> uh I, i'm definitely gonna pick it up this comes out on april 14th so you know about a month away and i'm that's awesome you know i'm, I'm really glad that like they're just putting their best foot forward uh, into like just re-releasing these games and you know in ways that are accessible and ways that like are you're just you're if you, in ways that like you feels like you never missed out on them. Uh, it is and whenever whenever I think about accessibility, I know this I'm biased on this, but I'm like it's coming to PC, so that way you know it's going to be maintained in some fashion. Yeah, from this point forward. Yeah, but but even then, you know, it's coming also to Switch and PlayStation as well. Mm-hmm. So that's cool. That 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 was announced on their Capcom Direct. That was like the only RPG news on the Capcom showcase, that, aside from like. Stranger Sunbreak coming to Xbox and PlayStation like April, I think. Mm-hmm. Other than that, yeah. Well, we're actually going to go into a lot of these uh, release dates finally because I think we've cleared up every other headline here. So, it's been kind of a surprisingly heavy news week now that we actually have worked our way through it. So, most immediately, we have a, as far as I understand, a semi surprise console launch for Walson Lords of Mayhem. This is a Diablo-like hack and slash that released back in 2020. I don't know a lot about this game. But my understanding is that it was has been PC only since its release. But on March 15th, alongside its continuing update into Act 4, it will be coming to PlayStation and Xbox consoles as well as on PC. So just kind of a, just kind of a neat, unexpected surprise for those who have been waiting for this game can now play it on console as well. Yeah, I, I wonder how this game is shaping up these days. I... Like I heard it launched a very rough state, and then for several months it was like that. I, I obviously it's gotten a lot of patches because it's been an early, an early access for quite a while on PC. So I, I wonder like how what its final real quote unquote release date will shape up. 
about that. I know a lot of people were very excited for this pre-release and then were let down initially, but I wonder if they'll if they they can finally deliver the promise that you know being a good game, I guess, mm-hmm. in the release date. <laughs> of course, uh, we've got Diablo Four looking to crowd out the space pretty pretty soon. I still don't I, like. I still kind of still debating whether I should like risk my life eating a double down for a Diablo Four beta code. <laughs> Man, that food is so controversial. Has, any, has, any, has anyone checked in on Colin? Is he all right? I don't, well, I don't he's know. not here, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Next release date that we got is last month. We had the announcement of some of the Riot Forge projects, where they have expanded their League of Legends IP into other media spaces. And we had the announcement of an action RPG called The Mage Seeker, a League of Legends story, which stars the character Silas. Who I assume has a bunch of story baggage from the from League that I don't know. But in the announcement of the Mage Seeker, it was kind of trioed with a bunch of other announcements in this Riot Forge general presentation. So we just kind of had to like glean a few tiny clips of gameplay from that general announcement of what the Mage Seeker actually was. We've learned that the Mage Seeker is going to be launching on April 18th. It'll be launching on basically everything: PlayStation, Xbox, PC including both Steam, GOG, and Epic Game Store. And we also finally got a gameplay trailer for the Mage Seeker, a League of Legends story. And to summarize it in like one sentence, it looks like Hyper Light Drifter in a League of Legends skin. Which, hey, Hyper Light Drifter was pretty damn good. So I'm not saying that to belittle it. It's just that's the... If you're not looking at the trailer yourself in front of you and I have to describe it, that's how I would most concisely describe it. It's releasing at, good, at a good time, I think. Mid-April has kind of got a little bit of space, I feel, for, for smaller projects like this. So I could see myself poking at this when it, launch, when it launches in about a month from now. I think I'm a fucking, he's going to become a, a League of Legends lore master without ever touching League of Legends. <laughs> yeah, <now>. I'll <laughs> play every other, I'll play every League game except League. I guess yeah, I got to watch it. Yeah, I got to do that. I've heard, which I've heard is immaculate. So yeah, uh, that's a very good. <laughs> Uh, like uh, Josh mentioned, Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak. Monster Hunter Rise did release for Xbox and PlayStation back in January. The Sunbreak expansion will release for those consoles on April 28th. One day we will be out of the realm of Monster Hunter staggered releases, I hope. Starfield. If you remember right, this was one of the first release dates that we had for 2022. I remember early last year, like a year ago, they had slated a November release date for Starfield. Which at the time felt like, oh, okay, I guess they're pretty confident in it. And it got delayed. I, th- I think I think it was earlier than that. I think it was in 2021 oh, really? they announced the 2022 date. Yeah, and, uh, I remember that. Yeah, because yeah, because I remember your release calendar. It was like, well, we don't know what's coming out except Starfield. Apparently, is November second. I remember. I remember seeing at that time when they that when they announced that November 2022. That like, there's no fucking way they're, they're making that. <laughs> even even in 2021, I was like, I don't know. <laughs> that seems oddly specific. <laughs> So then it got delayed and was previously planned as a nebulous first half of 2023. We've learned this week that Starfield has been delayed from that first half of 2023 window to September 6th. And in addition, there is a Starfield Direct, quote unquote, set for June 11th. And I guess that makes sense. That kind of feels like when a Bethesda Game Studio game would be expected to drop right at the early you know, holiday holiday window. And of course, it sounds like they're planning to kind of market this game right around that summer E3 time frame. I suppose the uh, the launch date did get a a release trailer along with it, but the trailer is a lot more studio back end and talking heads and less actual like game footage. There is game footage in the trailer. It's a lot of Todd Howard talking at you. I I, I have to assume this is the last like this set. This is like. Now the firm release date, like there's no way they're gonna push this back now because like it feels like it feels like one of those dates like they have nothing to lose by like um they could have announced the date to be like any time from like ne- like tomorrow to like the end of the year. Like they had they have to be confident at this point, like okay, this is a date that we can hit. Like they think about like everyone who's waiting for this game is like we're willing to wait as long as it takes for like this game to just come out in a, in a decent state, you know? And hope and hopefully when this game comes out on September 6th, that like it, I, I hope it shows uh, that the the investment Microsoft has been doing for this game as well. And mm. but again, and you know, ho- hopefully, it like it shows that its initial launch date. Like, I don't, I do not want this game Starfield to come out. It's like it's your, it's your, 
it's your typical Bethesda buggy release, yeah. especially after Fallout 4. What will know? come out faster, Starfield or Star Citizen? And I'm not even, I'm not even, I'm not even counting Fallout 76 and like that release date of that. We don't talk about that. <laughs> uh, but it's just... Or, or Elder it, Scrolls 6, which is a logo and a mountain, is all it is right now. Yeah, so I, I really hope that like once this game comes out, and like right away, it better be like, okay, this is well worth the wait. This is well worth, you know, Microsoft's involvement in this, you know, whole whole thing behind the scenes with the with their purchase with Bethesda. So we'll see, we'll see. Yeah, I'm excited for Starfield, but it's one of the things where it's like I'm just curious to see. It's got such a long development history, yeah. and I'm just like, what what is the outcome of all of that? Well, like for me, I think for for me, it's just. I'm interested in like getting hands on in the game. I'm not really, I'm not really curious about seeing more of it because like I don't like. I think I already have a general expectation to like what to expect from it. It's just like I just want, I just need, I just need the word of mouth to be like, oh, it's another, but that's the buggy. Because I do not want to be there on September 6th and be like, all right, do I, do I still play this game or do I wait for patches? You know, this that seems to be a running theme from the get go this year. You know, it's, it's been a long thing. We, we've been. Starfield was announced in 2018. Jesus. Yeah. But yeah, but like, I don't want this just to be another game. Like, it seems to be like a running theme for this fucking year, dude, of like, oh, this game's out. Better wait for patches for it to like work, you know? Wild Hearts, a whole long, yeah. in some yeah. cases, you know, like a Dragon Asian. You know, like, this game, this year's been fucking just a disaster on that front, you know? Uh, yep. And, uh, come on. A couple other release dates. We already talked about Front Mission 2 is releasing on June 12th. Here's one that is kind of confirming what we had already talked about on the podcast and speculated based on some tidbits of news. So of course, back at the Nintendo Direct in early February, we learned of the Atelier Marie remake, The Alchemist of Salberg. And when looking at some of the... Adam will jump in and correct me if I state this correctly. Looking at some of the store listings and digital deluxe editions, we saw that it looked like as a pack-in, it was going to have the original classic game of Atelier Marie Plus, The Alchemist of Salberg. Suggested, wait, that game never came out in English. Atelier Re- Marie Remake is coming out worldwide. Does this mean the first official English version of Atelier Marie Plus? And the answer is yes. It'll be releasing in English for the first time with English subtitles as a menu option for the Atelier Marie Remake. So it's nice confirmation from Koei Tecmo about kind of what we had speculated based on the information we had during the announcement of the remake. However, I think it is exclusive to that digital deluxe edition. You can't just oh, buy it separately. Gotcha. But e- either way, like I think this will actually push me over to like buy the digital deluxe edition of this game, because I think that is so fucking cool. It, it does kind of suck that it's like exclusive to the super expensive edition, but nonetheless, you know, putting in the effort to fucking localize this game, like the original version alongside the remake is such a weird fucking prospect that like I I can't help but like support the notion. That's really cool. You know, I'm glad and, that they finally it. Underneath the, uh, and understandably, underneath the tweet about the announcement, people are saying, like, well, I want to buy the game physically, but I, only on the digital deluxe edition. That's kind of, you know, I, you know, know, yeah, I understand yeah, that. I feel uh, that, yeah. Yeah. that they have it's very understandable that people are kind of bummed about that. And that's kind of been where games have been trending, where like we're just seeing less and less physical releases. Mm-hmm. A bummer, but that's, that's, where we're at now in 2023. Rune Factory 3 Special will launch on September 5th for Switch and PC. I don't really have a lot more other detail from that. We didn't know the release date back when this Rune Factory 3 Special was announced in Nintendo Direct. And oh, oh, wait, is, is, is the PC version announcement new? Or did we know that? Um, I, I think we knew that. I think we knew that. Question more. I think pretty sure we... Oh, no, no. The, Matsu does say the PC version is newly announced. That, oh yeah, the PC version is new. Okay, okay. Yeah, Switch exclusive before. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it's not it's imported that game, so you might hear me talk about it in three weeks, depending on how fast the shipment gets here. Oh shit! A child's already on it. Oh fuck! Are you excited? Well, <laughs> this is my best. I think it is the best Rune Factory game in my opinion. I know mm. it's it's a lot older than than other games, so it's missing a lot of key features, but. I think this is the only game that doesn't overstay its welcome, you know? Mm-hmm. It ends on a quick, good note. Like, some video games just doesn't know when, when to end it. Should, should this be our first Rune Factory, or should I just wait for uh, 
I thought it was going to be Harvest Stella, but they... well, I got you four. You can always give it a try. Oh, yeah. You do. <laughs> I mean, of course, Chow. I always remember that you got me four. <laughs> I totally did not just forget what it stopped. Like, I never played it. It's no, I, 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 I did. Right. Fuck. Thank you, Chow, again. <laughs> now you're forced to uh, <laughs> play. I, I like how Chow, yeah, Chow got me for my birthday. I forgot it was a like Christmas or birthday present. He's like, <laughs> yeah, he's like, I got you this instead of Cyberpunk because Cyberpunk is no longer on sale. <laughs> like, thanks, Chow. Appreciate it. And the last uh, release date that we have, oh no, I lost my podcast document again. Too many tabs. Uh-huh. It's a Sora Online. Nobody uh, cares. All right. Sora <laughs> Online, last recollection, launches October 5th in Japan, October 6th worldwide. There you uh, go. I just gotta say, we, me and my friends stream anime all the time, and there's this one guy who doesn't show up, but if we ping him for Star Art Online, he'll show up no matter what. Okay? That's all it takes. Just Sword Art Online, and he's there? Yes. You just you just tell him we're watching Sword Art Online, he'll come in. You know what's really, what's really funny about this uh, trailer is, like, it's part of the Partially to like you know reveal the theme song for this game, it's by Rion, um, you know, very talented artist who's like who, who did a few of like the Sword Art Online openings. But like the name of the title of her theme song for this is Vita. I like that a lot <laughs> because you know Sword Art Online really popped off when, when the Vita came out with uh <laughs> with with, with the, all the releases it had on there. So that's uh you know coming full circle. You know what you know what I mean? That, and like that that's that's the whole trailer. It's like a, a good chunk of the trailer is like yeah like kind of commemorating all the old Sword Art Online games and like everything's really been building to this moment, you know? I remember I mean, when I mean, Sword Art Online was just like a single anime. I mean if you course, died in the game, you died in real life. Look, like SAO is like technically SAO is kinda of like on a lull right now, okay? Because there's like the, the story that they that they're that they are gonna I mean adapt one day before we die, seemingly, you know? still like in the middle of like being written like it's still being you know the light novels are still coming out for it or whatever but it's like it's not not enough material to make an anime of that so they're kind of like at a standstill so right now like the only thing that they've done recently is like they made like two films yeah the progressive like the the two films like retelling the events of like the first sao but from asana's perspective I think. and that's where I they're at that's your decent but... i need i can't i can't motivate myself i'd have to watch it with like Friends and raw shit talking it <laughs> while they're doing it. Maybe like that's the only way I can do it. <laughs> and maybe you know, maybe they are good. And maybe we'll have a good time if we watch it one day together. I can't. I can't. <laughs> but hey, there we go. We have our first October release date for our RPG this year. Mark your calendars. Sort out on that. Good hype. Good hype. You know, now now that now that we're on the subject. It's not really related, but I, I'm on my full copium here. We're going to have um, a hot hack concert event. 20th anniversary event. It's a concert that's, at the time of this recording, airing tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Being broadcast tomorrow. So surely this is the time after that concert, it's the time to announce a new dot .hack thing, right? Right? I don't know. Checks out to me. Checks out to me. I don't know. I've never played a <laughs> dot hack concert. concert. Uh, I'm convinced. <laughs> Kingdom Hearts has done it, you know? If Kingdom Hearts can do it, why can't Dot .hack, huh? Okay, okay, let's bet that there's a new Dot .hack material coming after the concert. I think also, wasn't the Near Replicant remaster announced at a concert? I I don't think so. I mean, I went to the Chicago one, and they only had the original Near footage in it. They, weren't, they didn't announce it. I don't know, I don't know if Birdly announced the, the Near Replicant remaster, to be honest. You, you might be right. It's not unheard of to reveal something new for a game, like a new, like announce a new game at a concert, especially for a Japanese game. Yep, during the 10th anniversary concert in March 2020. All right, so back on my hopium for this one. It's gonna happen. I just gotta, I just gotta believe. Believe it. Well, that reminds me. I read. Uh, there, apparently, maybe you guys in the know know more about this, but they're like making new episodes for the original Naruto anime for like 20th yeah. anniversary or something like that. So I swear, I, I, think I saw something. I think I saw something about the Boruto anime is ending. But I, uh, I, I, the, I heard that like part, the part one of the finale of Boruto is coming. I don't know if that means that like there's going to be a part two of Boruto or like Boruto is ending. I don't so, know. Uh, anime news network. Had, I only read the headline because I, I don't know. Dumb. <laughs> o- original Naruto anime gets four brand new episodes for 20th anniversary. 
Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. I, I blame Attack on Titan on this thing where they said Final Season Part One. It's like, I yeah, yeah, I, 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 I love I love uh, the news good on uh, the Attack on Titan bullshit. It's so funny. I saw someone compare it to like they the the Mad Lads really just compare it to like Photoshop Final Version Final Final Two or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Anyone, who, anyone who's written any sort of document knows this. Where you yeah. final and then like final 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 version two actual final. <laughs> uh, well, anyways, I think that covers us for all the news. Finally, we've got through all the dates. Adam, if you need help yeah. updating your your. Tw- 2023 document we'll get that make sure that gets up to date with all the new stuff that's coming in as we're going out of this giant first quarter of the year going into the spring months hopefully time of recording us in the u.s uh, we're losing an hour of sleep like tonight is that yeah yeah, not not, not looking forward to that Uh, obviously uh thank you uh josh for going over your impressions of paranormal site and of course even though he's not here we were able to cover james's Articles that are up on the site for both Destiny 2 and the Steam Deck, as well as the Trails to Azure review that went up this week as the game gets officially localized and released next week. Uh, you can find RPG Site on all the social media channels. Just search for RPG Site on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, or Instagram, and you should be able to find us. You can join our Discord by hitting the link at the top of our homepage at RPGSite.net, or we should have the link below the uh, any of our YouTube videos uploaded at our YouTube channel. And we will be back next week with another episode of the TetraCast. Thank you so much for listening. If you have any feedback about what we're doing well or what what we could improve on, go ahead and just leave a comment either on the site post or underneath the YouTube video or wherever you're listening to this podcast. We'd love to see that and know what we can improve on from there. Until you hear from us, stay safe and take care. We'll talk to you next time. Final, final version two. Final.